presence of the quorum, I'm going to call the meeting of the Amherst School Committee to order at uh, 7.57 p.m. Uh, for those of you who have been watching, we actually had called to order a while ago and then um, adjourned for a short time for executive session and now are back. So welcome, everyone. So uh, the first order of business tonight is to approve minutes. Uh, we have quite a few minutes to approve, actually. So we have minutes from December 18th. Uh, January 7th and January 17th, but I will do one at a time. And uh, if we can observe our usual protocol, which is to uh, get a motion to approve minutes first, and then we can discuss each one of them separately. That would be great. I move to approve the minutes of December 18th, 2018. Second. Thank you. Any questions or comments? I'll give the, the committee a couple of minutes to review these as needed. Seeing no questions uh, or comments on this, um, all those in favor of the minutes for December 18th as presented, signify by raising your hands. Thank you very much, it's unanimous. Okay, I will take a motion for the next set. I move to approve the uh, Amherst School Committee minutes for January 7th, 2019. Thank you, do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Dumling. A moment for the committee. Okay, if there are no questions or comments from the committee, um, can you please uh, raise your hands, signify aye. Thank you, and uh, do we have abstention? Okay, so we have four uh, ayes and one abstention. Mr. Nakajima. I move to approve the Amherst School Committee minutes for January 17th, 2019. Thank you, do I have a second? Second. Thank you. In committee a moment to read this as well. Any questions or comments from the committee? All those in favor, signify by raising your hands. Thank you, it's unanimous. Thank you very much. I just want to take a moment to acknowledge uh, the very hard work of Ms. Westmoreland for preparing such excellent minutes for all of our meetings. When you see them presented all together like this, you really get a sense of how much work is involved in all of this, so thank you so much. Okay, uh, next order of business is committee announcements. Are there any announcements? Mr. Dumling. I just want to quickly take a moment to acknowledge a couple of uh, updates in the, the front of the uh, privatization war that is, is in full swing across the country. One positive, one negative update, positive. Uh, if, uh, late news is to be believed, the uh, Teachers Union of Los Angeles has, uh, is nearing ending their strike, scoring a major victory for public schools. Um, if you haven't been following this news, it's, it's been very key. Uh, it shows the power of organized labor and the power of people fighting not really for their own benefits or money, but really for conditions for their students, class sizes, nurses in schools, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and a, a really huge pushback against, against those uh, privatization forces, so, so kudos to them. Um, it's, it's important to acknowledge those victories. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, at the uh, DESE Department of Education meeting this morning um, in our state, they finalized the agreement um, to expand a charter school in New Bedford. Um, it's being hailed as a compromise, but it's, it's absolutely nothing like that. To, to paraphrase the vice president of the MTA, it's, it's not a compromise if somebody puts a gun to your head and asks for your wallet. This is a charter school that's getting a free building in a neighborhood where students won't have a choice but to go to the charter school and the funding still comes out of the New Bedford Public Schools, um, raking that budget over it. And so, you know, I, I mention this not because it has a direct effect on Amherst, but because uh, we have our own fights um, against privatization locally and, and uh, in our region. And I really feel like our best shot at resistance is whenever there is uh, a, a front that opens up on this uh, in this grand issue that we, we really stand in solidarity with, with uh, our brothers and sisters 
is how I look at it across the country, across the state, whether it's teachers, parents, community, uh, fighting for the future of public schools. So onward as we go. Thank you, Mr. Demling. Very well put. Okay, if there are no further announcements from the committee, uh, moving on to public comment. Um, we are a few minutes past the time that was stated on the agenda, but if anyone has any public comment they would like to make, um, it's obviously a little different here in the town hall than it is in our school where we usually do this, but please come forward uh, and you can have a seat and just uh, state your name and you have three minutes. Oh, totally understand the spirit of compromise and that, you know, there were two kind of camps and ne'er shall they meet and I feel like what you have proposed requires both sides to give up something that is of value and, you know, I'm just um, saying that I really appreciate the work that you've done, that I see a path forward and I'm really hopeful and optimistic about the listening sessions and the process that you have so we can get something uh, to MSBA in a unified way in April. So thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments from the public? Seeing none, I will close public comment. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is superintendent's update. So Dr. Morris, we'll turn it over to you. To make some time back on the agenda, I'm just gonna share one item since so many of the other updates are in the agenda that we have in front of us, which is that on Friday afternoon, um, I shared with the committee that um, there was some advocacy done by this committee as well as others around the proposed expansion of PVCICS, which is a charter school in Hadley, uh, and the commissioner is not recommending the expansion. Um, so thank you for your advocacy on that front. Whether the school chooses to appeal that expansion is unknown right now, but the DESE will let, uh, will let me know if they do appeal that and when the date of the appeal will be heard, and I'll communicate that whenever, if I receive it uh, back with members of the committee. So thank you, Dr. Morris. I just want to add one little note to that. I think we've talked about this at previous meetings, but um, there was quite a bit of advocacy from many different districts in the area around that specific uh, proposed expansion, including from the Collaborative for Educational Services, and we had um, various other school committees um, in neighboring towns who wrote letters to the commissioner. So I think all of that actually has made a huge difference, uh, hopefully, in uh, the commissioner's decision to not endorse this proposed expansion, but thank you. Mr. Nakajima? Yeah, I um, uh, thank you very much, Superintendent. Thank you for all the work you've done on the subject. Um, I hazard to say that the, the way in which the Pioneer Valley Chinese Immersion School pursued their expansion, um, I'm hoping in some ways rationality prevailed that as, as you can see from the work that we had done to advocate, um, their assertion that they were a model for, for the drive integration was so at variance with the previous uh, decisions from the commissioner and the previous boards of education and the existing data that it's something that um, even though I recognize what Mr. Dubling said earlier as being very true that there's a broader challenge that we're under around policy, um, the idea that you can open up a front based on, that's in some ways reality based, and advocate on that position and find that at least you're finding some positive audience at the state, uh, very positive in this case, is we should take heart in that. 
and particularly in a country right now in which it seems sometimes reality-based advocacy isn't always welcome or even finds a toehold to, to land. Um, but, uh, but we'll need to keep at it. There's no question. Thank you, Mr. Nakajima. Mr. Dunley? Yeah, I also want to just want to take a brief moment to thank uh, the advocacy from, from uh, our local select board prior to, uh, to the, our changing government from our, our town meeting. Uh, prior, prior to the change, change in government, both advocated for a moratorium on expansion of uh, charter schools until the funding formula is fixed. And I also want to uh, uh, um, uh, acknowledge the leadership of our recently elected state representative, Mindy Dome, and uh, Senator Joe Comerford, uh, who have been vote, both outspoken uh, leaders on this issue as well. So thank you to them. Thank you. Okay, uh, so the next item on the agenda is uh, budget guidance discussion, and this actually stems from uh, previous conversations that we've had at the school committee level uh, regarding um, area issue areas or areas of the district that we wanted to learn more about. And I see quite a few faces in the audience, some of whom I recognize, um, and a few that are new. So welcome, everyone. And I will turn over to Dr. Morris to introduce uh, folks as needed. Sure. So uh, if I can do just one minute of orientation on budget guidance, um, and then I can mm -hmm. move forward. So um, for those who, who weren't here, perhaps in our November meeting, um, or your November meeting, the idea is that we do budget guidance by, the committee identifies a couple areas they'd like to hear um, kind of some themes about, what, what's happening in those areas to inform um, kind of that budget process. Prior to that, we had really overarching large thematic statements about budget guidance and the concern was that it didn't really inform the committee um, or the community about kind of the budget process. And so there were four areas selected by the Amherst School Committee. Three of them uh, we'll talk through tonight, which is English language learners, library technology. The fourth one is food service and we'll come back to that in February based on the agenda um, and also based on Ms. Palmer wanting a little more time as she's trying to spearhead um, a particular program as it relates to elementary food service. Um, the extra month was well or almost month was well appreciated uh, by Ms. Palmer. So I just want to acknowledge that there was a request for food services to be looked at at the elementary level and that will happen. It's just not going to happen tonight. Um, so because of our um, significant agenda and the hour, we asked each of the three areas, uh, English learners, library technology, to prepare a five minute presentation. I know that a couple of the areas presented many more slides than for five minutes because they wanted to provide uh, more background information for the committee uh, that could be done in a five minute presentation. So I wanna thank everybody for being here and thanks for the significant work that went into this. And I apologize in advance for um, truncating the amount of time that, that any of you could speak about all of your areas. I think I've spoken to everyone here at much greater length than five minutes about what they do and, and their world. And that's not really what tonight's about. It's really to give the school committee and the community a snapshot of the programs that you all uh, work so dutifully in. So tonight we'll start with uh, ELL, actually Ms. Richardson, who you've spent a lot of time with uh, in the fall, and she'll be back for a later agenda item as well. Um, to describe a bit, uh, she'll share, share a lot of data about English language learners. And I'm not sure if, I think, oh, you have a flash drive? We'll see if that works. Okay. And just a reminder for um, speakers who are going to be coming up, uh, it looks like that one microphone is already on next to Ms. Richardson, but the other one might not be. So whoever comes to, to the microphones, please just press push. <laughs> Hello, uh, thanks for having me. So as Dr. Mara said, I prepared a very short um, overview and hopefully can just give a snapshot and answer any questions. Um, it's, yeah, there's a whole lot to say in a really short time. I'm also not feeling great, so my brain's a little slower, but I'm gonna give you <laughs> what I can. Um, so this is kind of an overview of students. Um, so we continue to see the student population of English learners growing and that's both in terms of numbers, but also in terms of the complexity of needs. And, um, you know, we just see a really wide range of students from our well-schooled newcomers who come and, you know, maybe are here a shorter time to our students who have had limited former schooling, um, you know, may come to us in fifth grade, um, not yet being readers in their first language. Um, 
you know, there's just a, a wide range of different backgrounds and experiences. So we're really lucky to have this amazing, diverse um, population, and also the needs are really quite, um, quite intense for our staff and, and for our schools. So we are seeing our language groups are listed there. Spanish and Chinese are the largest, um, and then the, the following are listed, but there's, of course, many more languages, um, getting close to 40 if we list all of them. And we do see more students, as I said, um, that are termed SLIFE students, or students with limited or interrupted formal education. And that designation comes from um, if students are English learners and they are two years below grade level in both native language literacy and math, um, or numeracy. So those students come in and we know already that they have kind of a higher level of need that we need to address. Um, we do see a lot of students that have dual needs where they are identified with a disability and have an English learning um, profile. And we do have a lot of students coming and going too. So that transient number um, is shifting every year, but often that's families of either visiting professors or graduate students or folks like that who are coming into our community for a shorter time. Um, So that breaks down kind of some of those numbers. Um, and then this shows by grade level on the left what our numbers are looking like right now. Um, so it makes sense that we would tend to have fewer English learners by sixth grade um, overall because many students who entered in the beginning of, our, of schooling with us may have exited by that time. But of course, we have students coming in throughout um, the reds are students that are being monitored, so they're former English learners, and that number is going to continue to grow for us because we now are monitoring students for four years after they exit the ELL program instead of two, so the, that um, group is really on our radar for longer to support and make sure that we're providing what they need to continue to be successful. Um, and then the levels breakdown is there um, as well, just to give a sense. So I think, you know, if you kind of look at the spread, when we think about student needs, uh, our, our beginners, right, our level ones, our level twos, those are um, students that are really at the beginning of the process of learning English. And so they require a, the, I, the bulk of our support um, right up front, right, to get going. But then they really need that level three you'll see is the biggest because that part takes longer in the um, trajectory. So usually we see a pretty quick increase in, uh, in English with the beginning stages where there's a lot of social language and we quickly kind of get functional and then that transition into academic language takes a lot longer. So the level three is that place where we need to get them um, more at like content, grade level content and help support to push them through. Um, so that's the overall there. Our instructional programs overall, our beginner and low intermediate students generally receive some pull-out groups or self-contained classes. Um, and they, many of them also receive interpreter support in math and unit study um, as needed. So we aim for about two hours of support a day if we have the staff, um, if the schedules work, right? So that's a whole other challenge um, to arrange. And the DESI guidance is a minimum of 90 minutes of services daily for students in that group. So that's our levels one, two, and three. Um, and then for th levels three to five, students are more often receiving their English instruction through co-teaching in the classroom. Um, however, there's, again, a range, right? So we may identify a particular need with a certain group, and they may get you know, a 20-minute pullout that's a focus skill group. And so we really try to be flexible within our schedules and um, who's in front of us to meet the needs. Um, so I think that gives, yeah, a, a real quick um, picture of that. Here's our staff. And I think it's really important to point out that there, we have amazing teachers. They're working really hard to meet the needs of students. They're creative. They're flexible. They're really going above and beyond all the time. Um, but to have 20 students, depending on what those student needs are, is a lot for them. Um, and some of the tasks that, in addition to all the things that you regularly associate with teaching, um, some of the things that they're doing in addition for their English learner programming 
uh, are listed on the side. So we've really taken on trying to do more um, upfront family interviews to gain more information so we can be proactive to meet student needs. Um, as I mentioned, we're monitoring former English learners for four years. We also need to monitor students whose parents decide they do not wish to have direct ESL instruction, um, but they are still considered English learners. Uh, when we have SLIFE students, we need to develop individual education plans for them. And the Look Bill, which recently passed, is also going to require us to have individual education plans for students who are not meet, meeting benchmarks on the access, um, which the goal is to reach proficiency in six years um, so that they would exit within six years. Um, so I think you know, there's just a lot of pieces there that come with the role, um, a lot of advocacy, a lot of collaboration, right? a lot of places where we look to those folks to really be the voice of, hey, how do we meet the needs of language learners throughout? Um, and I think co-teaching is a really good example of ways that we're doing that, that um, we started, this is our second year where we said sort of officially that we're supporting co-teachers for all um, English learner teachers at the elementary level. And though they were skeptical at first, everyone has had a, a really positive experience with it. Um, they've all, you know, there's challenges, of course, right? Like any co-teaching situation, but they've seen really positive things happening for kids. So. Um, and that's not just for the English learners, right? Because now you have a language expert in the classroom who's supporting all kids with learning academic language. So, um, and then let's see. So we have a, a few paraeducators supporting our students and our interpreter team who are also fabulous. Um, and they, again, go way above and beyond to meet the needs of our students. They're technically interpreters, meaning they're just translating the instruction. Um, the reality is that they're tutors and supports in all kinds of ways in helping us connect with families as well. Um, so I'll stop there and see what else you want to know. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to turn it over to the committee for questions or comments for either the superintendent or Ms. Richardson. Ms. Spitzer, Mr. Nakajima. Thank you for this presentation. Sure. Just one quick question. Um, just in the beginning, you mentioned that there were up almost 40 languages being spoken in our classroom. So when I look at the staff and the responsibilities and I see, um, you know, there are probably languages that some of the, uh, that are spoken by students that aren't spoken necessarily by the staff here. And I'm just wondering, do we ever contract out for interpreters, for example, or how do we deal with it if, if there is a kind of a language spoken by a student, which isn't included in the language profile of the staff that we have currently. Right. So um, we do our best to find them is the, is the first answer. So the 40 languages, all of those students are in our district, but they may not require an interpreter, right? So we tend to have the most beginners who need an interpreter in those eight language groups, I think, is what we have identified right now. Um, but what happens if we have a new student that speaks a different language is I get a request and I do my best to outreach to the community and see who I can find. Um, so it's really, yeah, pretty pretty on the ground. And then and that's in terms of direct student support. In terms of translation services, we do have relationships with UMass and a couple um, business providers in the area that can do translation work for the parent piece where we need official letters and things like that translated. Mr. Nakajima. Thanks so much. Um, and um, I'm, excited, I'm excited that you have a chance to present this and that we have a chance to go in um, deeper on, on the subject. We've been, I think for the last couple of years, we've been talking about um, our ALL programs. And I just, we never seem to have the time to dig in as deep as it'd be great to do. Um, and I guess one question I'll throw at the at sort of the back end of this thing mm -hmm. is since this is a budget guidance um, item, is if, if there are any resources or stress points that you have that could be ameliorated or just substantially improved in terms of outcomes with budget. Um, and I mean, I know that feels unfair, I guess. I don't know, maybe it could feel unfair, but I mean, it's sort of what, it's what we're here for. Right. So if there's something that would be really helpful, it'd be great to, great to know it. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, what I'd love to hear more about are the students with limited or interrupted formal education and um, 
how that population has grown if it's grown, mm -hmm. and the kind, sort of generally speaking, the kind of challenges um, that you're seeing and how that relates to our resources. And I, I know, because I know it can't be specific, as a general matter, um, for the, I guess it's called the tier two mm -hmm. um, IEPs that you're developing, talk a little bit about that and um, how that's going. Because I mean, to me that's, I'm sure for any number of families and for students who are entering into our district and our schools, uh, it could be a challenging process to continue to improve their native language and also adopt a new language. Mm -hmm. um, but I, if you had other life experiences that inter are interrupting your schooling or your transitioning schooling, if you come in um, to the district for some reason, that's just got to present significant additional challenges, I imagine. And I'd just love to hear about what we're doing a little bit more about that, if that's okay. Sure. Um, let's see. So there's a bunch of questions in there. Um, in terms of needs, uh, just big picture things, I think um, some of the pieces budget-wise are um, just looking at over time building our staff so that caseloads can be a little smaller and we can have more flexibility to meet the needs. Um, so, you know, when we get a new student who has a lot of needs, all of a sudden everyone's reworking their schedule because it's not like we just have, a, you know, somewhere to put them in. Um, so that's where our teachers are going above and beyond and going, okay, I'll split my prep and I'll go here for this, you know, 10 minutes less and I'll, like, this kind of shuffling, right? Because they're really looking at how can we do this best. Um, Another piece that I've recommended for next year is to have an ELL building-based teacher leader position that could help manage some of the, all of that extra stuff that has to happen. Um, so just to stipend a little bit to acknowledge that that work is happening and to help um, manage between central office and, and the schools. Um, there are a, a lot of the ELL budget lines, um, to be blunt, are not really existent. And um, Dr. Morris and uh, Mr. Sheehan have been really good about supporting us in a variety of ways when we need materials and um, when we need professional development and things like that from other places. So, um, you know, over time, I think having a, a more robust budget that just supports English learners in that way would be great. Um, but we have, you know, we've been flexible with meeting needs and collaborating with different departments. Um, so that's the first question. Um, the, so I, I want to just clarify that, it, um, just so we're clear between special education, that the SLIFE students are getting what I should have put as individual learning plan. We don't want to confuse it with an IEP because it really is a different need. Um, and that's something that we have to be cautious of in our service delivery, right? Because it's really easy to jump to the conclusion that, well, they're way below grade level and so maybe there's a disability, and we have to watch for that. Um, so this is really an individual learning plan to say, well, if the student hasn't yet been taught to read, how are we gonna teach them to read, even if they're at a grade level where we don't traditionally teach that way, right? Ms. Richardson, um, can I just interrupt you for one second? Because I think sure. Mr. Nakajima might have had a follow-up. No, I was just gonna say I deeply thank you for doing that because I'm very familiar with the term of an IEP for special needs services, yeah. and because I could imagine a subset, not all, but a subset of students who are behind, significantly behind grade level might also have mm -hmm. potentially a need for some additional services. Right. Um, I'm glad you clarified that. Yeah. But, but actually, I hate Great. to say this, but that actually reinforces my question around what are the broader issues that um, students who have had interrupted learning are, are confronting and how are we support? So in other words, right. that's cool. Yes, Thank and, you. Right. And now I'm also gonna be really <laughs> curious to find out if there are in fact other sort of wraparound needs that we find that some of those kids have and if they do, how are we helping them? I mean, if yeah. it's not true, then you corrected it's a bad assumption. It's absolutely true. Yeah, so you can generally, you can say that if a student wasn't getting regular schooling, um, then there was probably something going on, right? Whether that was um, coming from a place where there was violence and families didn't want to send their kids to school, right? And how does that impact the child and their family? Um, whether it's in some places there's, you know, if there's an environmental disaster and students aren't able to go as regularly or funding is cut. And, there, you know, so there's a lot of reasons that we see these things happening. Um, and like I said, if we're, if we're coming in with the assumption that there are two grade levels below what we would expect in numeracy and literacy, we just have a big job to figure out, you know, we don't want to um, kind of pull them through our grade level curriculum without filling the gaps, right? 
So this is because this is a newer population, this is really a challenge that we're working on right now. Um, again, doing our best with creative solutions here and there. Um, so there's not a standard approach, and I don't think there can be to some degree because it depends what, what each student needs, but we're really looking to our math and reading specialists to help identify needs, um, to help be creative with what the solutions are. So, Of course, there's um, kind of a wraparound, like family center support and all the other things that our schools do to support families, too. Mr. Or Dr. Morris? So I think um, I agree with what Mitch Richardson said, and I think adding to it, um, the context matters and also the grade level matters. So when students are coming to us with interrupted schooling at second grade, it's a markedly different thing when they're coming at sixth grade with interrupted um, schooling, um, and not just on the academic level, but, but on a whole, a whole host of other uh, less, quote unquote, academic levels as well. And, um, this is something the state has seen a huge increase as well as we have locally, and they're trying to develop resources, but um, I think they're struggling for the same reason that we're struggling, which is every situation is somewhat unique, um, and there's no rhyme or reason as to, um, no way to predict what grade levels, what students, uh, and what resources would be most beneficial. So it is something that um, I know Ms. Richardson talks about with Mr. Sheehan and myself frequently, and she's not the only one uh, who talks about this, and um, I think we need to develop a kind of more comprehensive approach to, you know, the term is SLIFE that I think the state actually is using as well. Um, students, um, and some of that's about resources as well in terms of books, you know, as Mr. Schuster said, just to put a finer point on it. So we have a student coming in in fifth grade to use her example who has not learned how to read. So it's not just, right, around language learning of English, it's actually around how do you have books that a fifth grader would want to read that's at a reading level that's appropriate for a fifth grade student. So it goes beyond kind of more traditional English language learner challenges to a much broader set of issues that um, our librarians who will speak in a little bit um, have been central players in actually on the resource delivery side as well. Right, yeah, so that like finding high-low books um, or figuring out, you know, some it's like how do I read, but then it's also how do I just do school? Right, like we have students who come in who haven't been in school um, for a full day, for a full week, for a full year, right? And so they're just kind of like looking at the clock, like what is this, you know? Um, so to get them available to learn, right, in the way that we expect, because they do have all this rich life experience, we have to figure out how to tap into that rather than always expecting them to do it the way that we want to do it, so. Yeah. Any other questions from the committee or? I actually have a couple of questions myself. Um, thank you again for putting together this presentation. Sure. Um, I want to get through these quickly because I know that there's a lot of other uh, items on this agenda. And it's a long one. <laughs> yeah. um, but this is also an important one. And, and as Dr. Morris said, um, and Mr. Nakajima also referenced, we've, we've been talking about um, you know, English language learners for a couple of years now in various contexts. And so it's really great to hear um, a little bit more detail. So um, looking at the second to last slide that you had about staff and responsibilities, mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, uh, you know, you've got 9.7 full-time teachers, uh, each with an average case of about 20 students. Uh, kind of if you have any sense, either you or Dr. Morris, about what best practices would be for ELL learning in particular, especially given the challenges that you've identified already. Mm -hmm. So this is a tricky one because the, um, what's appropriate really depends on the student. Mm -hmm. So this, this same kind of conversation was just happening um, in, within my colleagues in the region, different folks saying, you know, people are thinking about budgets and what are different caseloads and um, if you look at the data, there's a wildly huge range of, you know, anywhere from about 15 to 70, right? I mean, it's just like there's some places that are way under-resourced. But also for someone to have, um, you know, 30 students who are level fours or fives and who really just need a little bit of a push in the academic language piece to access content, it's really different than having a beginner, you know, 10 beginners, right, who need two to three hours a day Lots of co-teaching, lots of collaboration, modification, et cetera. So that's maybe not helpful, but that's kind of the reality. Dr. Morris? Yeah, so I'll, I'll add to Katie's uh, not helpfulness, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is that I think also, um, if you could go back a slide or two, Katie, actually. So I'd like to actually go one more. Oh, actually, there we go. So I think the, the other challenge is that, uh, 
If you look at the right side of this slide, you could see the different numbers of level one, two, three, four, and five students. What's not in this slide is that our staff are generally working in one of three buildings. So it is a challenge. There are moments or there are years where, you know, for whatever reason, a couple students move to a different community and there's a little more flexibility in one school, whereas another school has the opposite thing happen, that the way our schools are sort of currently organized, as, as wonderful as they are, doesn't help for flexibility of ELL staff to go where the needs are. Um, and right, it, it doesn't always work out like, oh yeah, well, in, uh, we've got a bump in third grade or second grade, that might, that's, these are district numbers, they're not actually at the school level, which is where the staff are, they're at the school level offering those services. So I think, you know, I agree with Ms. Richardson's point, our caseload is is not atypical. Um, I think it's a little better than some districts, obviously not as good as, uh, as some others. I think in the overall scan of Western Massachusetts, we do pretty well with those numbers. Uh, at the same time, kind of the needs fluctuate so frequently, not just at the beginning of the year, but throughout the year, that we, are, we sometimes struggle to um, have the right staff in the right place to meet the, the kids that we have uh, and the needs they have. So I think that's what's hard when you look at the math of it, doesn't really describe kind of the whole picture on the ground level. Sorry if that's not helpful, but that's how <laughs> No, it's fine. Understand. I guess I was looking for more of like a best practices, you know, if there's a, you know, any, any thinking or writing on the, on the a subject, if, you know, there's a recommendation. But I, I hear what you're saying about the challenge yeah. uh, given the difference, you know, need. Um, my other question was really also about, uh, you mentioned uh, there's 21 interpreters in eight languages, and I was just wondering what the sort of the work status is. Are these full-time employees? Are these part-time you Great. said they're doing Question. tutoring, you know, um, what's their... So these are hourly paid non-contractual employees. So this is not ideal, um, but it is how we've managed for a long time. Um, it's not ideal because it doesn't support them, right, in, in being long-term stable employees. Um, and it doesn't, you know, it, it retention, right? When we have fabulous interpreters, we don't often get to keep them that long because they're going to look for a better deal. Um, We've been little by little increasing their wages, but it's still, you know, to be blunt, I, the responses I get sometimes when I offer someone that position are, you know, that they would make more at Panera. So it's, it's just not, um, you know, it's, people do it because they love it and because they care and because they have the skill, but not because it's a good position in that sense. Okay, thank yeah. you. Okay, I see uh, no further questions or comments from the committee. Um, so I guess, thank you very much. I really sure. appreciate this. Um, and Dr. Morris, I don't know if you want to introduce uh, the next uh, agenda item. Great, thank you so much. Ms. McDonald? Is there any way we can monitor so that we can see people's Yeah, it's, faces? it's a little. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was, I'm yeah. <laughs> can we tilt it back maybe? Yeah, if we could tilt it back, maybe that might work. Yeah, there you go, because that actually provides a little more. <laughs> Thank you, I was actually thinking that before too. It's just, it's really hard to make contact, yeah. <laughs> so while they're setting up, I'll introduce Lainey and Susan, who are the librarians at Fort River Wildwood. I know Waleska from Crocker Farm was not able to be present tonight. Um, but they've got their slides ready to go, and I know they've got uh, lots to say in a short amount of time, so I'll let them go. Thank you and welcome. So we, I am Lanny Blackman from Fort River, and... I'm Susan Wells from Wildwood. Thanks for having us. And Waleska Santiago Centeno from Crocker Farm can be here. Um, we're going to attempt to... Well, we attempted to explain our programs in five areas, community space, teaching, integrated learning, resources and reading, and we're gonna attempt to hit on those in five minutes. Um, so the first thing is um, that we are community spaces within our schools. And so that means that it doesn't just mean physical space, which the physical space is important, um, but we're creating these spaces where all kinds of different activities um, learning activities and things inside, outside, in between the classrooms, after school, during lunch, all these things are happening. 
Um, and so that space includes facilitating the needs of people and being flexible, um, but also we do house books and we have a need for that that um, continues and actually grows. For instance, at Fort River where we're looking at um, adding, we're excited about adding the dual language program and looking at the space needs of books there. Um, oops, there. So, this is such a great opportunity because I think a lot of people in the public sphere don't realize that we are librarians, but we are teacher librarians. So uh, we teach classes every week, and currently I'm teaching 24 classes, which you know only leaves like six sections, six 40-minute sections open a week, which would mean that if I were teaching and there were no one supporting me in the library, such as our fantastic paraeducators, then the library would be closed to other students. And if you look further in the slides, we're circulating over 58,000 books a year, and a lot of that happens while we're indisposed with a classroom of kids teaching research. Uh, this is kind of a snapshot of in that week and all those minutes that we're teaching and all the kids that we see, we have the K through six gamut, and we teach a lot of different things, right? So I'll start the day by teaching fake news, with fifth and sixth graders, which is so very important right now and hugely in the media, um, whether you believe it or not, right? <laughs> but giving them the tools to evaluate material that they're looking at online and being good digital citizens, right? Um, but then we'll go to fourth grade and we'll look at uh, tall tales and how that connects to their study of American regions and the theme of progress versus nature. And then we'll be working with a second grade, teaching them how to orient themselves in the library and find a book that they would like to read that's at their just right reading level. So it's, it's all different teaching objectives throughout a day. And in some days, we could cover every single one of these boxes. Which brings us to... <laughs> how um, we have really worked hard to integrate the library as a standalone class, but also with the curriculum, so that we are doing pieces of co-teaching. So that we're looking at a kid from kindergarten and saying, you have an inquiry need. You have a question you want answered. Where are the places you can go? You can come to the library, you can get a physical book, you can go online, and how are you gonna do that in a safe way and get your question answered? So this is the research cycle. And we start at a very simple, here's your question about the solar system, all the way to animal adaptations in third grade, which is team taught that we built together as a third grade team, librarian, the art teacher. There's, it's kind of a 4D experience that this year they're adding a Technology. physical technology, oh, yeah, thank you, um, that they're adding in a physical piece with dance, an interpretive dance about their animal. So this is an experience that a third grader has across the curriculum. Um, <clears throat> at Wildwood, to give, us, give you a snapshot of what we're doing, you know, numbers are great and looking at minutes and books and things like that, but what, what are we doing in each of our spaces at Wildwood, I've worked hard to uh, make the MCBA program, which is a reading list for kids from fourth to sixth grade, come alive for them with the makerspace. So what they do is they pick from one of 25 books, one of 25 books, they take that book and they make it into a game or an activity in the makerspace, which makes it active learning. Uh, it's usually collaborative. Many students opt to work in partner pairs or groups of three, and then uh, the public comes and plays their game. So there's so much problem solving, building, engineering, I mean, just so many, so. Social skills. Yes, and it's multifaceted in a lot of ways. And uh, this year we added the 3D printer to the makerspace, which is really phenomenal to have that. Um, so another connection I would like to make is uh, the students as leaders and teachers, right? We, since we see kids from K to six, we get to develop this relationship with them. And we also have the opportunity to do um, cross-grade experiences. So on Thursday, I'll be taking a group of fifth graders who have been studying the Coretta Scott King illustrator exhibit that is currently at the Eric Carle Museum. And they'll be the docents to, a, to second graders as they take them around this exhibit. We won't use the docents in the Eric Carle because the fifth graders will be teaching the second graders. 
because I have that class time with second graders, the surprise is the second graders are also going to teach the fifth graders because they've been doing their homework too. So this is a really great opportunity for them to work together, but also see themselves as leaders and teachers. Um, so uh, some examples of integrated learning at Fort River. Um, I sort of focused on how in all of our programs, the um, library skills happen in library class and everywhere else. And so um, one example here, um, many languages read aloud at Amherst College. I got together um, students in the fourth, fifth, and sixth grades to read our books in our library that were in their first languages and to read them together and to explore that collection. And then I brought um, students to Amherst College to do read alouds and their family members or community members um, from our school and beyond to listen to these read alouds. Um, another example of library skills going places and all the in-betweens is um, we recently started a saga chapter at Fort River, um, which there's one at modeling after the high school, um, a sexuality and gender acceptance group. And this came out of um, student leadership um, last year, which led to an assembly around how all genders are welcome in our school, um, and now is a lunch club. Um, and so these are the some of the ways that we're not only integrating with the curriculum and tapping into student inquiry and making them leaders, but not and beyond the curriculum. Um, and in that, um, we're also building relationships with students um, for their entire trajectory in our elementary schools. So actually, yeah, uh, last week, this um, third grader who I mentor turned to me and said, Lanny, all the specials teachers, you're the only ones in the school who know all of us, huh? And I was like, we do, we know all of you. Um, and that's true, and that is not just, you know, 340 or 420 names, but um, what are your interests and how can we support you um, academically and socially? Um, and so here is a slide that's an example from Crocker Farm, really focusing on how um, integrated learning means connecting to families and community and culture. And that's happening in all of our libraries too. I'm sorry, Valeska isn't here to, to throw this at you herself. Um, so we're gonna move on to digital resources, which this is an area I'm very proud of. I think it's a, a place for families, uh, our community, to be a part of what we've made for online resources, which are, you know, are digitally out there for people to access all the time. Um, and they're free. And they also support students, uh, special education students, English learners, because it's most of our, our suite of things that I would really urge you to click and explore, because you can, um, at your home or any other time, uh, they are resources that n read in a natural voice to the student and highlight as they read, which shows that every emerging reader needs and, and supports emerging readers. So uh, when I started in 2015, we had access to 24 eBooks, and now Sora alone, which is our newest e- and audiobook platform, gives us access to over 7,000 titles, and we continue to grow. So those are connected to the curriculum. They're in audio form, they're also in ebook form, and then there's a read-along feature for our youngest readers, uh, which is a very, like, almost like you remember putting in the, putting the record player on and, you know, turn the page, and, but it's highlighting as they go, and they can do it on any kind of tablet, a phone, and it's free to our families. So families have really responded to that. But there's also many other things to look at there, a lot of nonfiction. Uh, research that supports our curriculum and then helps kids to go above and beyond. And beyond just um, telling people in our schools that they can access these things, um, they're these resources are dependent in some cases on our um, state teacher licenses, having access for our students. Um, they require our management um, and our collaboration with excellent departments like the IS department who've made that possible for us to be able to fund these resources. 
Um, so we do do reading still, um, in case you were wondering. Last year, um, we had almost 59,000 books circulate across our three schools, which if you want to average it out, it's about 54 student uh, books per student last year. Um, and the frame that we use to really promote reading, and I hope you've seen throughout our presentation everything that we do, is um, mirrors, windows, and doors. Diversity is important to us, and we see that it's important to our students, to our teachers for learning. So we want everyone to see themselves, to be able to see others, and to know how they can get involved. Um, so we're talking about race and gender and social class and ability and language. Um, and to pick a not so arbitrary year, um, but in 2001, this is what books looked like. And the book world is catching up. It's very, um, it's very white based. Um, 2018, this is more what the book world looks like. We have access to more um, of our students seeing themselves represented, not just, for instance, in historical fiction, but in um, folklore, in fantasy, in getting your hair cut, um, in um, regular things. So we picked these years to illustrate because, um, as you can see here, from 2001 to 2018, the cost of books has increased, um, but our funding has stayed level at, um, in our libraries. Um, but, I mean, it is an exciting world where um, in 2001, Heather Has Two Mommies was this iconic work which was like the only diverse um, book about families, and now we have all kinds of books. Um, so the spread from Real Sisters Pretend um, is a book about um, a family with adopted sisters and understanding that they belong and are real sisters, um, and it's also about families with people of color and families with two moms and all these things um, wrapped up together. Um, so we bring this win windows, mirrors, and doors and this focus on diversity to things like our MCBA mashup list um, where we make sure that students of different abilities, students of different races, um, um, gender identities are seen. Um, and we don't just do this because it's important, but because our students want it. So these are um, three examples of um, books that represent um, various students. And you can see this first one here um, at Fort River. I didn't promote this book at all. Um, it's about a prince who's trying to marry a princess and ha happens to love wearing dresses. Um, and in just three months, without me ever mentioning this book, but having it on, well, no, I mentioned it, um, having it on display, it was checked out 47 times. Or Ghost in two years, 105 times. Um, so I think in closing, I just wanted to say that you're always invited to any of our libraries. Please come visit us. Yes, we welcome you to join us anytime. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, any questions or comments from the committee? Mr. Demling. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for coming. And <clears throat> excuse me, I'm a little under the weather. Um, I'm so happy this is, this is recorded that we can like point people to. I, I feel like, I know how you guys feel, I feel like Part of my school committee life, I live in just constant amazement of the the end dimensions of our schools. Like, I feel like after two years, I should be able to give a fairly comprehensive presentation of everything that we offer. And then something like this happens, and I'm like, the depth. I mean, I knew some of the things you were talking about. But it, it just makes me so happy to, to know that we have this kind of excitement and engagement. Um, I, I loved what you talk about um, with being a library teacher. and. There's, there's so many like highlighted possibilities here of, of the things you, the, the fake news. I, I want to take that fake news class with you. I mean, I've, I've thought about proposing that in our curriculum. And so the fact that you've taken it upon yourselves and you're doing it at the elementary level, which is exactly when it should happen, is so fantastic. But the fact that we have a, an all genders welcome Fort River Saga Club at the elementary level that's led to a lunch club, and it, it's such a thing to be proud of in our community. Um, you know, it's like. You know, it's just a sidebar comment to Dr. Morris. You know, when we think about all the amazing things we offer in our schools and that are sort of like these hidden secrets that if you dig deep enough, you, you understand. It's, these should really be like front and center in terms of like what are, we, 
what do, what do we want to celebrate that we are doing so over the top well? You know, it's, you, I mean, you guys are rock stars for making this possible. And I love how you framed the makerspace and all those examples. I mean, sometimes people think of makerspace as this like dry engineering STEM thing. And you know, the, the way you inject that in the humanities is, is just so great. So um, I really don't have a question other than keep doing what you're doing. And if you have, you know, resource constraints, there are, are ways that you think are like, uh, where a, a small or a medium kind of investment would be a huge thing for you, mm -hmm. you know, let, let us know and let us know what the students are telling you because it sounds like the way that you approach your uh, job is to really connect with the students and then respond to what they're, they're doing. So, so thank you so much. Currently our PGOs uh, sponsor all our author visits. So the author visit piece is a huge piece. Uh, last year, Lisa Bunker, she was just um, inaugurated in New Hampshire as one of the first transgender um, state senators. She was, she's an author and she came and visited our sixth grade. Um, so for them to see her then go on to be elected was, was super powerful. And that was funded by our PGO. So um, the author visit piece is a real piece that I think we could expand to get more diverse authors into, into the schools so kids can see, wow, I can do that. That's really great to, to um, just to jump in very quickly the you know the, the remark about how the community actually supports this kind of learning, mm -hmm. and I think the libraries in particular I've heard from many community members uh, just you know singing your praises, but also just singing the praises of the program and the work that goes on there. Um, so I, I definitely appreciate hearing that as well, Mr. Nakajima. Did you have a? Yeah, no, I, I'm I'm always happy to hear about libraries, um, and I think what you're doing. I echo everything Mr. Demlik said. And, I, and particularly, I think some of the most exciting things we're doing, the notion of mirrors, uh, windows and doors, and also building in um, both knowing how to navigate and understand media of different sorts, um, learning to appreciate it and the diversity of that, of that literature, including things like read, if people it's first language are different than English that they're able to celebrate and share literature that's of first quality with a broader community, which I think is when we talk about the dual language program, we always talk about the cultural and social dimension of, of broadening out what is your community and changing perhaps people's, or just broadening people's perceptions of that, it's wonderful. And then the third dimension around makerspace is the idea that um, every, every student, every child, every person really should understand that they can not only um, consume some of the world's greatest art of different sorts, but that they're also active participants in reflecting on it and then also adding to that body. And so to me, the most exciting libraries are places where, where students can do all those things and as communities where people can do all those things. So I just think it's, it's wonderful to hear and I'm glad to have an opportunity to highlight this. I'm curious about one thing you said though. So you made the comment that your media budget was level funded since 2001. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so like there are different ways of presenting what that means. But in, in real terms, when you're showing the books costing $3 and then $7 for paperbacks, my question would be, uh, if this, this is for you or if this is Ernest Mangano or the superintendent, mm -hmm. um, is that like level funded but adjusted for inflation? Is that level funded meaning in real dollars, like not real dollars? Like what is in real or nominal dollars how is it level funded? Because the way you describe that, mm -hmm. you'd think you'd, after, after 17 or 18 years, you might need an increase. Right. So I don't have those numbers off at my disposal, and Sean can just certainly work on it, but our supply budgets generally aren't adjusted for inflation. So if you went at any of, and it's not to take the attention away from librarians, if you look at any of our supply budgets across um, this, or any district, um, I'll just speak to the Amherst Public School District, um, when it's level funded, it means level funded. So that was an accurate statement. I think the only thing, and I have to, I'd have to go back and look. I think there may have been a reduction for a while. It hasn't been, I, would, I, I think, and I don't have it again at my disposal at the moment, that it's actually fluctuated some, that we added some money back to the elementary uh, library budgets in 2000. I'm looking at Mr. Mangano. Yeah, I think it was four or five years ago. Yeah, so there was a decline and then it was up. So I think it, it's probably accurate that it's the same amount, but it, it had declined and then um, was brought back up to that level. So it wasn't like stagnant. Many of our supply budgets, frankly, are stagnant for a length of time. This one actually had um, dips and then rises. And I'm not suggesting that 
there, there, good work couldn't be done with more, but um, I want to answer your question more specifically. Mr. Nash, Nash, so um, I'm glad you phrased it that way because the last thing I want to do is to get like an line item war between one underfunded category and another underfunded category. Right, right. And I'm sure you don't want to do that either because you're talking about your colleagues and everyone's working as hard. So I'm actually like, I'm grateful that you like threw a bath of cold water on me and said, look, we're generally underfunded. Um, not that that's a real, I guess that's a really cold bath of water, right? <laughs> we're just generally <laughs> chronically underfunded. But um, sort of on the, on the back end, of a really inspiring presentation in which you can really see the difference you're making. And also you know that, everyone, you know better than we do, but I think everyone has the experience that the book you never encounter or the material you never encounter is a lost opportunity for new worlds, for new friends, for new experiences. And so this is one of those areas in which you can feel very acutely that, um, and also I guess because I'd, I'd, I hadn't, I'd seen the revenue numbers <coughs> and overall, probably like per, per capita, whatever, spending over the last 17 years, but I'd never actually heard in the last two years or two and a half years that there was line items that had, that had literally in real, in, have been cut, and in real terms actually been cut substantially. Because if the nominal dollars are the same, that means the effective cut is pretty substantial. And uh, I, I, I'm not sure there's anything you can say about it, but I just think this is something we talk a lot, and we talked earlier this evening about underfunding of educational line items at the state level. We talk about money being draining out of our district. We talk about what a challenge it is. Um, but in the end, and, and oftentimes we talk about, you know, this is going to hurt kids, this is going to hurt teachers, it's going to strain teachers. But I hate to put it this way, it all sounds like really abstract. It sounds sort of like we're talking in general terms about like some awful thing that's going to happen, you know, highlight at 11. And no. You're talking about real books, real resources, real things that you could do to expand the capability of you and your colleagues to teach and for children to experience worlds you know, beyond what they can do now. And it matters enormously. So I'm not sure that that helps because I'm not, do what you want, I mean, about with the line items because I can't, I don't want to sort of line item war, but um, we need more money. We need more money in their line items for that. I would say I think that the uh, you know what was what was stark for me um, hearing that sort of phrase that way about the mm -hmm. books is and then the the slides that you also had about the different kinds of books that are available to students now uh, highlights the point about you know how materials can make a difference right and and the fact that getting the right materials at the right time. Um, is really a benefit to education of, of kids, of course, right? Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, when you see those things kind of drawn out in that way, um, it really does make a difference. And it, for me, anyway, it, you know, I think thinking just to Dr. Morris's comment about uh, how we're underfunded across the board in the district uh, in terms of materials, that that is something that we tend to not pay attention to. We tend to pay attention more to staffing or to, you know, programs and things like that. <laughs> Materials are always sort of a second, you know, uh, you know, thought kind of thing. Um, in particular with books, you see how integral they are to learning and whole education of, of students. And so it really does make a difference to hear about it in that way. And I appreciate your, your putting it that way. It does make me think more now about our budget price, you know, process in general. Um, you know, we, we were never in a position where we have a ton of extra money, <laughs> but uh, in thinking about where we can actually maybe make some increases or improvements to the budget, you know, for all the different program areas that we have, um, is there a way to look at these things, you know, sort of a little more holistically, right? And, you know, can we make some increases or adjustments uh, in places where there's, you know, a lack of funding or level funding that has gone on for too long? with the recognition, uh, you know, sort of eyes wide open, that they make such a huge difference to the everyday lives of, of our students. So I, I want to thank you for that. I also want to say um, I appreciate your comments about the library paras. I know that that's also been a, a point where the community has come out full force for, you know, a number of years now, thankfully. Um, and, you know, I think they continue to be definitely an important part of, of this library program that we have across our schools. So mm -hmm. thank you for highlighting that. I also don't have very many other questions or comments beyond that, except to say thank you so much for the work that you do. Really appreciate it. Dr. Morris. One thing at the end. Um, 
I think in terms of resources, you know, there are occasional odd years, we haven't had them super recently, uh, where at the end of the year we do have some resources to expend and, and I will tell you that the librarians, we, they're wonderful expenders. Um, and I don't mean that it, to mean that they, uh, they uh, spend unwisely, it's actually quite the opposite, that they are ready, they know what they would spend the funds on if funds were available and, if, and we have went and, and shared uh, when we do have um, some, in relatively small size, I mean, to be very blunt, but um, they've got POs ready, like within 48 hours, they are ready to go because they really know what, uh, what the students need to the point that was raised earlier. So I appreciate that about them and we do try to find ways, even if not through the formal budget process, um, if we do have some flexibility in the spring, um, sorry we get you busy and we don't give you a lot of time, but you, mm -hmm. the staff really do a fantastic job of, of utilizing resources uh, if there are additional resources and that's it's one of our go-to places. Can I just say one thing about that? Yes, just recently we bought a binding machine, which many of the graphic novels that we get or that are so consumed so readily, they just fall apart. So then do we you know, purchase the same book over and over again or do we repair it for $2,100 at that time that you gave us that money? We bought a binding machine that we share among the three schools and we're able to do our repairs ourselves, which increased the life of a book, which mm -hmm. means more kids can read it. That's great, thank you. Any other questions or comments from the committee? Okay, Thanks thank you again. Thank you. thank you. Dr. Morris. Last but not least, we'll call up, not for the meeting, but for budget guidance, um, we'll call up um, Ms. Breen, Mr. Takayama, and Ms. Runyon, uh, who are the technology teachers at Crocker Farm, Hello. Fort River, and Wildwood, respectively, and thank you for coming thank tonight. You. Welcome. It's a test for our technology uh, <laughs> educators. <laughs> we really wanted to see if you'd be able to handle this, so. That's the PE portion of the show. <laughs> Thank so you. I'm Catherine Runyon. I'm a Wildwood technology teacher. I'm Trevor Takayama, the Fort River technology teacher. And I'm Liz Breen. I'm at Crocker Farm. <laughs> so we're going to tell you a little bit about some of the different things that we do. It's, um, we're a combination of technology educators and school-based instructional services. So we uh, or um, information services, so we, we try and take care of a little bit of everything. So between teaching, yep. um, teaching kids, teaching teachers, taking care of anything that has a wire, basically. Anything that can be plugged in yes. is our responsibility. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Seems to happen. All right. So our main role is technology educator, as Catherine said. We're part of the specialist rotation. We teach every student once a week for 40 minutes. And we base our curriculum off the Massachusetts Department of Education's Digital Literacy and Computer Science Standards and ISTE's Standards for Students. And we put that in the packet. So for kindergarten to second graders, we focus on keyboarding, educational games, and creative problem-solving educational tools. For sixth grade, third to sixth graders, we focus on research, project-based learning, and productivity tools. Uh, because each of the students has a Google Apps for Education account and uses Google Classroom, Docs, Slides, and Sheets often. Um, for example, we post assignments with links and templates in Google Classroom, and students create Google Slide presentations, Google Doc posters, videos, or other te technology projects. Um, Catherine's going to talk about digital citizenship, coding, and the robotics part of our curriculum. And so, um, what I'm one of the things is digital access. And we are kind of like the behind the scenes people in that a lot of what happens in the classroom and in other places does have something to do with the kids having access to technology. Whether it's in the library, we, we work a lot together in the library um, figuring out, we, we do the uh, fake news together <laughs> and, um, and we figure out how to get kids really get access to this information. Um, and so we have, we've create, we've bought uh, subscriptions for lots of different things like BrainPop, BrainPop 
and Bray Pop Jr. for different groups. Um, so that's used all over the school. And we want to make sure that kids have access, whether it's in school. We know some kids do not have access out of school, and so we try and work with the, the IS department, seeing how they can get access or figuring out when they can get access during the day. Um, we also think about digital etiquette, like making sure that um, kids can, or, or one more thing with the digital access, um, if they need to be able to read or write digitally, they can use the read-write um, uh, extensions for <coughs> Google Apps so that they can hear things or they can like speak into the computer so that they can get their information in there. Um, and it's not necessary for everybody, but we try and teach it to as many kids as possible so that they've got it available so it's kind yeah. of a universal design. Um, we also try and talk about digital access, making sure people know how to react to each other. Um, can they reply to each other, like in sixth grade, we start teaching them about email. Can they reply to each other without replying all? Um, that's a problem for a lot of adults as well as children. Um, but it's one of those things that if it's not directly taught, they never quite get it. And that's why a lot of adults have the problem. Um, um, can they respond responsibly? Can they, um, can they know how to relate to other people online? Um, we've all seen lots of issues with online things with social media lately, so we try and prepare them for social media, um, even though we know some, even some second graders have gotten social media accounts. They're supposed to be 13 year olds, but um, you know, like most of our fifth and sixth graders have some sort of social media oh, yeah. accounts, so we're trying to make sure that they become responsible with that. Um, and then we're also trying to protect their digital rights and responsibilities um, and their safety and security. Um, making sure that they know about copyright laws so that they're responsible about things. Um, making sure they know about their own online presence. Making sure that they know about how to be respectful of other people and be cautious about strangers online because we know that kids and some adults um, friend anybody who requests. So we're, we do have unfortunate frequent um, experiences working with our counselors and, and administrators about kids either sexting or cyberbullying or other things. And so we're, we're frequently in on those conversations and trying to figure out how to make them be even more responsible and, and be more aware of what is out there. So. So those, are, so those are some of the things about digital citizenship, being mm -hmm. having access and then being able to use that access in a really good way. Yeah. Another thing that we do is a lot of coding and STEAM. And I know I heard something about um, STEM and STEAM being kind of dry but earlier, but it is really a problem-solving experience. Um, whether we're doing the International Hour of Code, and using different languages like Scratch, Blockly, Logo, Python, Tinker, and creating either artistic <coughs> or um, animations or mm -hmm. games where their ki kids can create stuff. Scratch just came out with Scratch 3.0, which um, Liz and I yeah, were yeah. supposed to be at a, at a workshop today yeah. and on Thursday, but they canceled it, unfortunately. But we did go to a, a yeah, mini workshop a few weeks ago. Yeah. Um, but I've been using Scratch 3.0 and, and Scratch 2.0 for many years, and it's a great experience for kids to be really creative. And I've got some kids making like stories that are going back and forth or working together on games together. It's very cool. We've done robotics, um, whether we do like Here. Lego yeah. or we do, or and Mindstorms, or we're using ProBots and BeeBots, which use kind of a logo programming. Um, I have a couple of maps of the Amherst, of, of Amherst. On, on my floor that I've made out with tape. It doesn't have every street, and all the kids are like, where's my street? <laughs> it's, it's kind of a simplified map, but then I have kids use the ProBots and, and Logo to figure out how to get from one place to another. So it's kind of a fun problem-solving thing. And we use our 3D printers in our rooms um, and either print out parts of projects, or I recently worked with the uh, fourth graders 
to create maps of the United States that created puzzles, puzzle pieces with the 3D printers. Um, and so it, it, they can use these different things um, to show their knowledge in different topics. Mm -hmm. um, so these are all 21st century skills, just trying to figure out different things in different ways. Um, I know I've used uh, STEAM for having kids explore solar projects and, mm -hmm. and different in kinds of inventions and trying to figure out um, problem solving, how to make um, cars move in different ways or is like, what can you do with a solar panel um, mm -hmm. and how can you use that to make the world better? Yeah. And that's kind of been how, how I think of using STEM and STEAM is and engineering mm -hmm. to try and figure out, okay, yeah. what's, how can we make things even more exciting, more better? Um, yeah. So. yeah. Yeah, your Lego club. Yeah, and oh, I've, I've done, too. Yeah, and yeah. I've done yeah. the Lego, Lego clubs club. yeah. and things like that, so exactly. it's a lot of fun. <laughs> so. <laughs> but, um, okay, right. who was next? So we were talking about our technology classes, but outside of those classes, we do a lot of extracurricular activities. For example, we integrate with teachers by helping out in classroom projects. For example, I help out third graders create an animal slideshow that they spend two, almost two months on and they present it in April. We also collaborate with classroom teachers by teaching technology tools they'll use in the classroom. And we each individually help out in different ways around our schools. Wadwood has a lot of integration projects. Crocker Farm has a film festival and empty bowls night. Fort River has a student newsletter and a yearbook. And additionally, we run, uh, and Wildwood has first Lego League teams in the past few years. Do you want to say something about it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, um, we've had a number of Lego League teams, um, though we, not, we haven't done them in the last few years, but um, hope to get those happening again in the future. So. <laughs> and uh, additionally, we run coding, robotics, keyboarding, 3D printing, and 3D building clubs throughout the year. Um, now, Liz is going to talk about another important role we play at our school. Yeah. I know there's another whole piece to our job. Um, just like um, in the library, they're also running a book, um, a bookstore as well. Um, but we'd like to make you aware of some of the extra things that we, that we actually do. Um, we're the first ones to field all the phone calls and the drop-ins on any technical question. As we said, anything with a plug. Um, today, I had four jammed printers. You know, and the in there were no students in school. Um, <laughs> So, <laughs> um, students' Chromebooks that don't work, you know, forgotten passwords, any type of Google question, we're just the go-to um, person that comes, um, they come to our door holding a little Chromebook. Um, and then if we can't troubleshoot an issue, um, we're the, the go-to person to put in the work orders, and then we send them up to Jerry down at IS, and those guys are great. They, they're usually there within one day. Um, it's usually about 150 per um, work orders per year for each building, so that's quite a bit that we have to do there. Um, we're also responsible, what I call, for build, uh, bringing the uh, buildings online at the start of school. So for like the first week before, you know, school starts with all the Chromebooks, and you can see this is just a list of, you know, kind of the equipment, a general, general list, um, you know, how much we have now compared to what we've had over the past years. But um, all the Chromebook carts, because you know students move from classroom to classroom, we have to reorganize all those. You take the back off, you put them, you know, reorganize. And then uh, username and passwords for every, every classroom. So the teachers need that whole list. So there's a whole organization piece that's coming on the back end that needs to start up for that very first day of school. So we're um, doing that for, for the whole school, as well as getting our classroom set up, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> sometimes that gets to anything. But, you know, that's in addition to what we have to do as well, because we're also classroom teachers. Um, and then um, buttoning up the equipment in June, you know, just getting everything <coughs> organized at the end. So um, there's a lot of things that we feel uh, personally responsible for. You know, I know where every cart is. I know where every laptop is. I know... Um, you know, every, every teacher has a laptop as well that we're responsible yeah. for. And when Chromebooks go missing, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to have to talk to Mrs. Breen about that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, 
Um, we were also told to bring to this meeting maybe some improvements that we would like to see or, you know, some, some wish list types of things. So the ones that we found that um, came to our, um, the top of our priority list was we would li really like to do more classroom integration and really work with teachers a little bit more, as, as, especially as they've had Chromebooks and as the teacher's responsibility for teaching different things, our role has turned m more to STEM and STEAM but we would like to really work with the teachers on how can we integrate that with more of their curriculum that's going in there. So there's always ongoing talks about that. And then um, continued, the, the last one, the continued tech in, um, instruction at middle school and high school. Sometimes we're the last instructional um, technology teachers that the kids will see. Unless they choose for some of the um, electives in high school, but there's nothing really in middle school, mm -hmm. and they really have to seek it out in high school. Right. It's not an automatic kind of thing if they want it. Um, so lots of kids are like, oh, I want to keep doing this. I want to I learn more about this programming language. We're like, OK, well, here are a lot of resources where you can do it on your own, because right. come back and see us. Um, but otherwise, it, you may not have that opportunity. So. Right. Um, without organized stuff, some kids will just fall off the wagon mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, and not really, yeah, not stick with it. Right. You know, um, you know some of our spaces, but I mean, but we are limited by the size of the rooms and you know the organization of things. So, you know, kind of looking at those. So those are some pie in the sky things, but as well as things that we can actually, you know talk with teachers and principals and actually get to do in our classrooms, especially the classroom integration. And now if you have any questions for us. Thank you very much. We're like as possible. I know, I know, because you're like way far beyond on your agenda. We know that at this point. So uh, any you. questions or comments from the committee? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Nakajima. Sure. Um, thank you very much. Um, for sticking with, by the way, the time of the meeting, um, but also just preparing everything. And I think it's, it was, it's a similar uh, comment, I think, that was made earlier um, by a colleague of mine about the libraries, that when you start seeing, you know, all the work that you do and the many different ways in which you're, you're able to integrate with your colleagues um, an understanding, a sophistication, and then also an engagement with technology in different ways, uh, I think is really extraordinary. I think it's great. And so I, I just really appreciate your bringing this to us. Um, I, I, I sat on the Joint Capital Planning Committee last year, and so I feel like I've had lots of conversations, as well as our budget side, about like buying new Chromebooks and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like, do we need desktop computers? Any, like, like weirdly right, enough, right. I've been in another venue where I've had lots of conversations around technology. So the, it's, the, it's the educational piece and how you're, you know, the classroom work okay. you're doing that's really interesting to me. And, and um, it's probably not an appropriate topic for this venue, but the last bullet that they had on their improvement suggestion is like super meaningful um, to me because to me, when you look through the um, state guidelines or guidance on the subject, and then you think about um, just how <clears throat> students are engaging and then utilizing technology over time, right. and all the challenges that come from that, some of which are super practical, like how do you set up like a home network or something, yeah. and then yeah, others, yeah, yeah. others that are more sort of esoteric, like there's some new piece of fake news out there, or technology, how do I come to understand what I'm hearing in the news? Right. Um, right. And then just even other levels of computational thinking and things like that that are, that are super important. But I'm going to leave that there because you've said you're doing a wonderful job, and so this might be a topic for a different committee. Great. Thank you. Well, I remember um, many years ago in a <coughs> school committee meeting, one of the former school committee members said, well, kids already know how to use tech, so why do they need tech teachers? And, um, I hope we've proved them wrong, him wrong. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I, I want to say um, thank you also for, for coming tonight. Uh, I really appreciate it. And Mr. T is one of my, t my kids' favorite uh, teachers <laughs> over at Fort River. They're constantly talking about Mr. T and hanging out with him. Um, but I really appreciate it. And I, I actually really appreciate hearing a lot about uh, the nuance in your work. Um, so it's not just about getting in front of a, of a screen, but it's also thinking about you know things like digital etiquette right, and, and online security and safety, yeah, yeah. Uh, which are becoming such critically important things now for young people. Um, who are spending an incredible amount of time in front of screens, right? And you know, and that's as a school committee member, and even just as a parent, I think about quite a bit um, about how to make sure the time that that kids do spend in front of screens is productive, and that they're not just you know kind of sitting mindlessly you know doing stuff, but that they're engaged and learning. Um, and hopefully, you know, furthering their education in some way, right? And so, you know, I'm always uh, aware of a lot of the different programs that are, are made to offer, you know, even I think next door, there's quite a popular summer camp program um, for kids who are interested in tech, right? And, you know, there's a lot of promises made and it's, you know, it's very, mm -hmm. very expensive. And, you know, so it's, it's great to hear what's happening in our schools because I think that that actually serves as a... Uh, more thoughtful in some ways, um, in a lot of ways actually, uh, kind of programming around this, this issue. We do have to make sure our kids are you know, tech savvy. Right. Um, and this is the 21st century and there's a lot of things that will be <laughs> happening online and happening with computers and you know, in tech generally. So it's really great to have our schools actually aware of that and pushing you know, the boundaries as much as they can. Um, I, you know, I think that in just thinking about our budget pr process or budget guidance process, it's really helpful to have um, these suggested improvements. I, I also would want to echo, I mean, I think one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about is about classroom integration and how you actually um, sort of provide sort of cross-learning, you know, uh, tech with health, for example, right? Like how is, you know, additional screen time impacting mental health for students and even physical, you know, uh, decline in physical activity as a result of so much screen time. So how do we bring in those aspects into what's going on in our, in our tech classroom? Um, but then also just, you know, I, I love hearing about the combination of work happening with your team and library team and, you know, and bringing in those different ways that also represents though just extra work for you. And so, you know, I think, uh, you know, I, wanna, um, I want us to think about ways that we can uh, both share the burden and then provide also the resources mm -hmm. that you need to do your jobs well and to, you know, make sure that this is happening uh, the way that we expect it to happen and the community expects it to happen. But um, thank you again very much for, for this presentation tonight. And Dr. Morris, did thank you want to add anything to that? Very briefly. So um, two things. One is that uh, they breezed through it because of the time constraint. But um, it wasn't that long ago that we were in a Google district. Um, and you know, I had a teacher tell me the other day, because they were working on report cards, like there's no way I could do my job working with colleagues and co-teaching relationships if we didn't have Google. Mm -hmm. Like just, and, and that's not an ad for Google, that's just a, the way that there's file sharing and the way that <laughs> lesson plans can be co-authored and co-edited and, and collected. Uh, and that wouldn't have happened without the three folks who are here. The, the, you know, we did all the PD, the mass, like lots of people in an auditory, like that kind of PD. But the, <coughs> excuse me. But the critical pieces were that, uh, yeah, I did that PD, but Liz, can yeah. you yeah. show me how to do this? Because, right, that's my learning profile is going to be that I need yeah. someone on one tutoring. And, and so it wasn't that long ago that we had no file sharing in the same way that we have now. And so I want to really acknowledge that work, because now it's like sort of routinized that yeah. we have that. But that was not, it, it would not have gone smoothly without the support of folks. And, and so one thing that didn't talk, that, touched on the three of you, but um, I know you would have if you had more time, is around the mm -hmm. professional development end of things, which is not just the, the right. kind of some of the pieces you, you talked about, but it is really critical that we have um, kind of professional developers and technology supporting all of our staff. And the second is actually something that, need, that you didn't say, which is that technology in our schools is really about critical thinking, it's about analysis, it's not about the keypads and the screens, mm -hmm. you know, those are uh, vehicles to a much larger end uh, that we all, I think, can agree we want for our students. So um, I think you exhibited that by what you said, but I want to put a finer point by stating that very clearly uh, at the end of the presentation. So yeah. thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. McDonald. Just a quick clarifying question. All the other presentations talked about um, staff 
And um, I'm believing that it's just the three of you, but if you could just confirm that there's, you know, what, what is your staffing situation and technology in each building? It is, yeah, um, one, one per building. Yeah. Um, years ago, there used to be, we yeah. used to have paraprofessionals. Yeah, we used to have paraprofessionals in Fort River and Wildwood, which were the two larger schools at that time. Um, Mark's Meadow and Crocker Farm did not have that. Um, and the prayer for professionals were helpful in when we would get kids or teachers who were having issues. Um, we didn't have Chromebooks or even a third as many laptops at that time. But if we had technical issues, sometimes it, either they would deal with it or they would take over a class after we'd given the main lesson and then we would deal with something while they kind of supervised. Um, and so it was kind of an extra, extra hand for all the equipment. Um, we have probably tripled the amount of equipment and lost those prayer professionals probably about 10, Ten years ago. 10 to 12 years ago. Um, but as of right now, it is just one per building. Yes, at this point, it's one per building. And then I know that the um, IS department has shrunken in those 10 years. Um, and they're dealing with many, many, many times the amount of uh, pieces of equipment that they used to between the Chromebooks from the third grade through high school, high school um, all of the projectors which are now in um, starting, they're everywhere and they're starting to fall apart, unfortunately. Um, they're starting to fail because they're all there from about eight or nine years ago. Um, but they're being they are being, yeah, but they're being replaced, but it's, it's a process and it's um, time consuming for them. And they've been helping us with all of our extra equipment, their 3D printers, our, our um, dot cams. Dot cams weren't there 10 years ago. We didn't have dot cams. Um, so these are, they, they are working at a smaller staff with much more equipment. And so we are always thankful when they're with, with their response time and, and how, how really helpful they are to us. So we try to, we try to take off their burden by doing as much troubleshooting as we can, but it's, um, you know, that takes away from our student <coughs> planning or student work time so, as well. So it's a trade-off. Okay. Thank you again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so uh, Dr. Morris, moving along to our next item on the agenda is a dual language registration lottery. So um, in your packet, you'll see that there's a page right after the end of the technology presentation that has kind of like a blue flow chart. And uh, Ms. Richardson's going to come back up and uh, present uh, this. And this is for your feedback. We'd be looking to come back in February with kind of more formalized or perhaps there's consensus, I don't know, I don't want to predict that, but um, that we're not looking for a vote or any formal statement tonight. We're really just looking for your feedback so that we can come back in February with perhaps something a little more final uh, for us to move forward, which works on our timeline. Um, so, oops, sorry, I forgot I have to keep pressing this. Um, so I think I'll start uh, facilitating it, and Ms. Richardson, you can jump in as you'd like. Um, so last time we spoke about this, uh, we talked about making sure, oh yeah. Is this the same thing that's on the, in the packet? There's a small addition. There's a oh. small addition, okay, great, thank you. So, um, the original version, uh, all the way back into the fall, talked about having a process that would, um, after our kindergarten screening, uh, would result in families being notified whether they were part of the dual language program or not. One of the pieces of feedback we received from the community, uh, as well as from staff, is that um, going through screening at one school, uh, most families fall in love with that school. They meet the staff, they make a connection, with that school environment, the students meet the teachers uh, that they'll be working with, the counselor that they'll be working with, perhaps a principal or assistant principal, and that it was in students' best interest to actually have that resolved before the kindergarten screening process occurred. 
I think we've also spoken about in the past uh, wanting to make sure that we're trying to get as close to a 50-50 balance of uh, students who come with some Spanish language background and students who did not. So we you know, really want to compliment Ms. Richardson's work in trying to put together a flow chart that would explain a process uh, to sort of serve both of those ends, to have a process to enroll Spanish speakers in the front end, because in our community, uh, we, will not be, we will not struggle to have 50% of the students be native um, English speakers. Um, with our demographics, our, our kind of efforts have really been going, have been and will continue to be to encourage families who have Spanish language background to take part in the program, even if Fort River is not their home community or home school, neighborhood school, however you want to describe it. So I think I'll just walk through the flow chart and Ms. Richardson, you can, then I'll give you an opportunity to jump in and talk about the slight modification. So uh, our registration date is actually set. We're getting a nice banner for the town common, uh, kind of a new one, uh, which is uh, March 22nd it starts. We're actually having a registration event well ahead of that, which is just, we had it last year for the first time. We spoke about it in the committee last time, uh, which is just for families who are interested and students. It's just sort of like a celebration of our schools. Our principals go up and talk about our, uh, each school. Families can make positive connections. Uh, and then also we have, um, this year we'll have a, a separate kind of post meeting around dual language because we don't want to take a, any attention away from all three of our, actually Pelham's invited to so all four of our elementary schools, they'll be there. So uh, we have kindergarten registration beginning on March 22nd. Uh, we'll ask families if they're interested in the dual language program and their language background. You can see on the Ms. Richardson's um, handout something that you've seen in presentations earlier uh, around how we might ask for that information. Uh, at that point, next month, we'll enroll Spanish-speaking families. Um, there will likely be uh, events we're planning, and I know Ms. Richardson and Ms. Chamberlain are planning events not just at our schools, but in, um, in neighborhoods uh, for families um, to share more information, particularly Spanish-speaking families that way, and see how close we can get to that 50% threshold that's our aim. Uh, after that's complete, we'll enroll English speakers. Again, Fort River students, as we've discussed, will have the first priority if there are spots then we'll have a lottery, the lottery be pulled for uh, non-Fort River English-speaking, primarily English-speaking families. And uh, we'll notify families with the date of May 3rd, uh, all families, uh, with the exception of, we're trying to reserve four seats for late enrollees, um, of their status because screening doesn't start till about uh, two weeks after that. So it gives all families kind of advance notice and it's not like the day before screening starts, you get this information and try to just give families, because families may, put in for the lottery and then decide opt not to participate in it. We want to give families that choice. That's the general flow of kind of how we're currently thinking about this, but I want to turn it to Ms. Richardson if she, she wants to add a bit more before we open it up for more feedback. Sure. So the main thing that I added, um, just after some feedback and looking at guidance, I'll say that there's a lot of, it was helpful to look at a lot of different district models and talk with MABE and it's complicated, right? But. Um, but one thing that I thought was helpful in clarifying is now in the second sentence of that first block on the bottom, and that's right from DESE guidance. And that sort of gets at the issue that I think we talked about in the fall where they're thinking about two-way as being 50-50 is sort of the easier or older way of thinking about it. And it still makes sense for us to think about Spanish speakers and English speakers, but, but the reality is it's more complicated. And so the way that it was described there I think helped clarify that. So if you wanna take a minute to just read that, I think it, that might help with that piece. And just for the sake of the community um, who may be watching at some point, uh, I'm just gonna read this sentence okay. out loud because it's, it's not something that was in the materials in the agenda. So the sentence that's in question right now um, says two-way programs include approximately equal numbers of students who are monolingual or dominant in English at the time of enrollment and students who are monolingual or dominant in the partner language at the time of enrollment. Keep going. Sorry, that whole quote section. There may also, oh, I see the, the quote, okay. So there may also be students who have proficiency in both languages at the time of enrollment. A general rule of thumb is that to be considered a two-way program, no less than one-third and no more than two-thirds of the student population should be monolingual or dominant in either English or the partner language at the time of enrollment. So the way that they describe that last sentence, I think, helps kind of say there's flexibility here, but that's the range we're looking for. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Dr. Morris. And the last uh, couple things um, that I wanted to mention are in the kind of Q&A format, but I want to, again, just highlight some of those, um, particularly the ones on the back of that page, um, which is that we want to build in a place that if a student who's in the dual language program moves to another area of town, that they don't lose their seat in the program, and that's really thinking through um, families move for a whole range of reasons, and if we're committing, we're asking families to commit to this program for multiple years, we need to commit to families, as long as they stay within Amherst, you know, the bounds of Amherst, which is kind of the statute-based uh, point that we have. Um, that was one thing, and I think the other thing that we haven't talked explicitly about here is that there really is a team looking at the enrollment. It won't be one person. So you can see a list that it says the elementary registrar, ELL coordinator, which is Ms. Richardson, Fort River principal, and representative from human resources that we're trying to think through. Uh, these decisions aren't, um, they're not, as Ms. Richardson said, that they're not as binary as it seems, like one bucket here, there. And so having multiple um, involved in a team making these decisions in person seemed to make a lot of sense. Um, and so I just want to highlight Ms. Richardson's thinking about that because I think it's spot on. Any questions or comments from the committee? Mr. Dumling and then Ms. McDonald. Is, is this um, <coughs> the Q&A meant to be something that you would be available to the public? Just make sure you press the button for, I keep doing the same thing, but yeah. <laughs> it's after 9.30, so. I first go around with these. Um, is, is, this, is this first page meant to be like a, a public? Okay. Um, if that's the case, then my piece of constructive criticism is that that first uh, question and answer is a very helpful long description of why we consider language to be, why we're taking it into, into consideration. But it, it doesn't directly answer the question, okay, how, how's the lottery gonna work? Um, I, I think what might be helpful is to take that block, and the content is very good, um, as, as like the last ex explanation of why is language considered as a factor in the enrollment. And this is so, that sort of gives you the pedagogical background. And then replace it at the forefront with just basically a two or three Q and A that essentially you know recreates the information that you've done in the top. It says, "How is enrollment determined?" Well, first Spanish speakers in the Fort River district, and then Spanish speakers outside of, and then yeah. so it's like if you're just picking it up, you're not reading a long Desi quote. You're saying, "Oh, that's how the lottery works." Oh, why would you do it like that? Oh, here's a longer explanation on the back page. So just for public consumption. Yeah, yeah, great. Thank you, Ms. McDonald. Um, I don't know if this is more of a question or d just a, a thought, but in answering the question about what if I move, what if my family moves, and, and we answer, well, if you stay in the district, you stay in the program, it's going to beg the question about what happens if my family moves to Hadley or you know, outside of the district. So we probably should prepare an answer for that. And I don't know what the answer is, so. <laughs> Dr. Morris. Uh, if families don't live in Amherst unless they're... Um unless uh, there's school choice seats available and they, uh, there's a lottery system that goes with that that this cannot be a factor in legally, um, they would have to go to the whatever district it is that they connected to the town they reside in. But I think you're right to say that we need to be explicit about that. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Mr. Nakajima. I guess I have one. Um, in, a, in a meeting, uh, I guess sometime before, whenever it is, March 22nd, it would be great to, I don't know how you get feedback on where you're going to do outreach, particularly um, within neighborhoods or within um, Spanish-speaking community, but um, and I would just love to hear how that's going and that we're on the right track. It's kind of funny, like I'm not trying to delve and pry into it, but I just mean, I'm interested, I guess, in hearing more about how we're ensuring we're successfully um, reaching all the parents and as well as people's networks um, to engage them. I'd be happy to share that with the rest of you. So um, I actually, I think, you know, the, the what you've laid out here in terms of the kindergarten registration uh, timeline and approach makes a lot of sense. I would agree with the comments that have already been made. Um, I think this doesn't still 
quite tell us too much about the actual lottery per se. Um, and so I don't know if I'm, you know, if it's if it's an extra step that we need to identify in this flow chart or if there's actually like a separate flow chart that we need to describe. But again, thinking about this as a public document, um, you know, it doesn't tell us exactly, like for, for, for families that are coming in saying, I want my kid enrolled in this, you know, what, what can I expect? How can I put my name forth? It doesn't really tell you that. So I don't know if, if there's additional work that you're thinking about doing around that, um, just to make it explicitly clear. Yeah, can I ask what questions are you thinking of? Because I think the, the challenge is that we don't want to say too much because we need the flexibility to really look at who the students are and the complexity. Um, so we don't want to, you know, put a specific number, right? So mm -hmm. it says about 50%, right, for Spanish-speaking seats. Um, but, you know, is there wiggle room there? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's some things that we need to be really clear about and others that we don't want to say in that level. So I guess I'm, yeah. Dr. Morris. Wondering what are the specific Yeah, things? so how I interpret your comment, which may or may not be accurate, is that um, this describes on the district level sort of like this kind of broad approach, which I think for all the reasons Richardson said makes sense, but it doesn't describe that, so what do I do if I wanna you know, be a part of it? Like, how do I describe it? So I think it says registrations will, forms will ask families. I think having a little more definition on what that looks like, um, which this, this helps with, but I think it's not explicit. Um, there's no critique, I mean, like, right, we worked on this together. Um, it's not explicit about how that goes, and it's also not explicit um, in terms of like what we've shared earlier, like there's two lotteries, there's one for, I mean, you could, you could intuit it, but it's not actually explicitly listing uh -huh. that we're, there's a lottery for Spanish speakers, that'll go first, we're trying to fill to a roughly 50% of the class with the caveat that you mentioned or said, or done as read, right. and then there's a lottery for English speakers for, we're like, I think it's, it's, not, it's lacking a little explicitness, it's not that it's not there, it's just not there like, I think for this group, we would all sort of like, oh, I can see that, but I think for a public-facing document, we need to be more explicit. Is yeah, that and I think that's exactly that? right. And I think to, to yeah. communicate, you know, to families, uh, they, they need the details, they need the nuts and bolts, you know. So I think um, providing, like I said, maybe it's a separate chart or maybe it gets worked into this one, uh, very explicitly, you know, detailing um, all the, the, the different elements would be really helpful. And it also gives us, frankly, as a school committee, you know, a way to communicate this also to constituents, right, and to the community, just to help them better understand mm -hmm. what's involved. I, I saw Mr. Nakajima, and then I think Ms. Spitzer. Yeah, I'm gonna build off that point, because actually, just was just thinking about this, that, um, you know, you have a, a, a team that's reviewing the, the, um, the, the students who were applying families are applying to admittance into the program. And I think one of the things, I could imagine that if you get in, you're probably just really, really excited. And so if you get in, you, you, you may not care what the mechanics of the lottery are because you're just super excited to be in. I imagine if you don't get in for some reason, then you really care, if it mattered to you, if it was something that really your, your, your family cared about, that it's gonna matter enormously what the actual mechanics of the lottery are and how many of the factors in it are arbitrary and how many of them are non-arbitrary. Okay. And I'm not, I'm not trying to screw up sort of the art of doing this, but just as an example, if we're gonna use the term lottery, which we've been using in repeated meetings, it'd be interesting to know whether if you get a pool of, of 30 applicants and you know you can't take all 30 applicants, is there actually a lottery? Do you actually put like the names in a hat or whatever the mechanism would be, right. some random n number generator, and then you, you, you pop a name up, and then you review and screen that candidate and say, well, can we accept this person? Because we want to, they won the lottery, right. but now we need to make sure if they fit. Or are we using the term lottery, and we, I'm not trying to be funny about this, I'm literally asking, right. are we using the term lottery, but we don't actually mean it? What we really mean is we're gonna get people to apply, and then we're gonna apply a screen to the students to figure out whether they can fit and then if that's the case if we if we're taking 15 15 kids uh, in a given category and how do we t differentiate the 15th from the 16th and 17th kid if they're otherwise have relatively similar characteristics 
Yeah, I am having similar thoughts to, to Mr. Nakajima. Um, and one of the biggest things I think that if I were a parent and I wanted to get into this program knowing that my odds of being accepted if I'm in the Spanish lottery versus the English speaker lottery is different. How do I know at what stage in the process am I going to be told you're an English speaker or you're a Spanish speaker when we're dealing with the spectrum? So on, you know, I, I think a lot of us have had a little bit of exposure to Spanish maybe through preschool and we're t dealing with kindergartners and I, I just think that's going to be one of the biggest questions and it's not on here anywhere or forgive me if I'm missing the response. Um, and then I think having dealt with, um, you know, on a very peripheral level, um, housing lotteries, for example, in New York City for affordable housing, and, and some of these logistics that Eric's getting into are really important. I mean, we're not dealing with the same volume or anything, but I, I think, you know, you had to meet certain requirements, and it was very clearly laid out. You need to earn between this do many dollars and this many dollars. You can't have this or that. And I think we probably need to... I know we want to have wiggle room, but it's going to be controversial. And if we don't at least think these through, we're going to potentially have a lot of angry parents on our hands. Dr. Not Morrison, to be negative. <laughs> so, so because of other things in the agenda, like I don't want to belabor it, but I think what you raised is a really good point, but it's actually a really interesting point. So what I hear um, is comparing it, and I know you weren't using it as totally analogous, to a system where it, it literally is a formula. Right? So that's really different than the way we've approached this task. So I think it'd be really helpful to know if the committee's will is to make it more literally formulaic. Uh, you know, and, and that's okay. You know, I have some thoughts I'd share about it, but um, I don't want to come back in February with some of these other pieces done in terms of logistics, but uh, I still have it um, not meet that standard and then you know, kind of play out a, a perhaps awkward conversation. So I'm not suggesting that your comment is or isn't consistent with the committee, but I think that's a big, every, all the other comments I would say are, are sort of consistent, I can understand it, and so uh, perhaps I'm overly dramatizing my understanding of your comment, but when I think of New York City housing lottery, I wasn't thinking, and maybe you're not either, but. Ms. Spitzer, yeah. So I, it's the only other lottery process I've been involved in, so it's the one that I'm comparing this to. Um, but I do think we're, there's going to be a lot of gray area, so it's going to be really important to be transparent and document. If, so, I mean, I think the thing is with the, the housing lottery, you could always fall back on, well, you know, your tax forms that you were in between this and this. With language, you can't do that. I understand that, so I don't think we can do that. But um, because there are going to be more, I think there's going to be more demand among parents than there are seats. And so if we're going to, at the end of the day, um, do this fairly, we need to be very transparent. And right now, um, it sounds like we're going to be trusting the enrollment team to, to be deciding who gets categorized as um, an, a Spanish speaker, an English speak, speaker, correct me if I'm wrong. And then that kind of seems like the, the area where there's going to be the most um, sub, subjective decision-making process going on. Maybe, and, and that could have the biggest impact on whether or not, if I'm a parent, whether or not my child gets into the program. Um. So, uh, yeah, if you have a, a quick response, and then uh, Ms. McDonald also has, because we do have to move on. There's yeah. so many items on the agenda still, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so my quick response, and then I'm happy to follow up, because I'd love to hear more your thoughts. I mean, I think yeah. that's more consistent with the second comment. Maybe I heard the first comment differently, um, was consistent with the way we're thinking about it. I think we can be more explicit. Uh, so we're not judging Spanish speaking skills as part of this. It's right, it's the family who is self-reporting it. I think what we can be explicit about is that there's a distinction of, on this chart um, that may have an impact of where, you, where families self-report uh, their children on this chart based on, you know, Spanish only know English versus speaks English, understands some Spanish. And that may have a differential impact. I think we need to be explicit about that. So I think... Uh, you know, I, I hear what you're saying much more clearly now, and I may have misinterpreted your first comment, which I apologize. Ms. McDonald. And, and I, I was just going to comment on the, on the question about formulaic, because I, I think everything that you've been telling us over the, the last few months is that we don't want it to be too rigid and formulaic. So I, I back that, I would endorse that. Um, but I, I think um, I do agree that 
having more transparency and more explanation of the criteria that are going to be used as input in making that enrollment decision. So being very clear that there is some amount of subjectivity um, and just being upfront about that, but then being also very clear about here are the specific criteria. Um, it's, it's in here, it's just not sort of like, here's what we're going to look at um, and how we're going to do that. And I think also to your point of, um, you don't want to say, okay, if you pick box seven or eight, you're going to be considered Spanish, but sort of being clear that, that this, that, you know, that you're going to be using this to, to decide the, the composition of each classroom. Right, so. that's exactly it. And I was going to mention too that the home language sur survey is another piece that um, we would look at with this, right? And that has a lot of information about parents' first language, what languages are used most in the home, and things like that. So we can say that those two documents together will give us that picture of the language use. Yeah. Mr. Nakajima. Yeah, I'm sorry to throw in one more thing, but um, so I'm hung up on this lottery business. I, my, even if this isn't true in year one, I don't see how it's not possible that it would be tr that it, this wouldn't be true yeah. in year two, three, or four. That you're going to have a situation in which you essentially for slots, let's say twelve through <laughs> twenty, and let's say you only have fifteen, right? Um, but you have, but you have a, you've, you've you've analyzed the kids. You have twelve and, and twelve through twenty, let's say, of the applicants are all e are all in one degree or another equally viable. Um, students to be enrolled. If I, if I were told there is a lottery to get into this program, I would want to know that there is some non-biased, random way to select equally eligible within degrees of reasonable degrees of separation um, students. Because in every school system in America, like every single one, so this isn't about an Amherst story, you have situations where somebody assumes that because like you're the volunteer soccer coach and the soccer head coach happens to be married to the person who is on the enrollment team, then that, that we all know that's why Janie and Jimmy got into the program because they're friends. It's not random, it's because they know someone, right? And everyone always feels like, or whatever the story is, I mean, I'm making that up. My point is every district in the entire country has some story where they feel like there was, like they, maybe they just moved to town, maybe they're new, they don't know anyone, so they don't have any way to like get an inside hook on the way things work in this town, and but they want to know that we're treated fairly, and so I get the um, subjectivity or the range of criteria you deal with to try to figure out how you get a good pool together. But I also think you got. I mean, in my view, and I'm saying this very strongly because I believe this very strongly, you got to find a way to be able to explain to people and also adopt a practice that also allows for absolute fairness and equity to, for all the families in town who want to be a part of this program. And, and, and there are going to be so many no's that we have to be able to explain to folks who are going to be able to legitimately come to you and say, I have a case where I can tell you for a fact my kid is perfectly eligible for your program. And to me, what you're going to have to be able to in position to do is say, well, actually, you're right. And here's how we treated the 40 applicants or the 20 applicants or whatever we got who were all equally eligible. And I apologize we didn't have the slots. I am, I'm saying this very forcefully, but, I, but I'm telling you, and I strongly believe it is absolutely a mistake not to have something built in that you can explain to people that we're doing. So, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, a lot of districts either live stream the lotteries or they do it uh, live, like a public meeting. It's for exactly that reason, we would do one of the two. But again, it's, it's about being explicit and we can do that in the next draft. So what I'm going to recommend is uh, it sounds like, you know, the, the committee is more or less aligned just in, in terms of having this be a more transparent process, have some more detail about the selection process initially um, that we could then share with the community. Is it possible to bring back some suggestions or recommendations for the committee to consider um, at the, for our next meeting, which is end of February at this point? Yeah, that was the plan. Perfect. Yeah, yeah so at the beginning, this was gathering feedback to bring back another draft. Great. Yep. Okay. Great. Um, so thank you again, thank Ms. Richardson, you. for all the work that you've put into this. It's sure. really just coming together amazingly well. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for all your comments. Mr. Dunling. Uh, yeah, just, just for um, planning purposes for our agenda, just wanted to kind of, because I see some members of the audience and it is getting late and we have a lot to get through. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to sort of recheck in with people about what our estimated maximum end time is. 
I don't know if we ever checked in initially, so. <laughs> I, was being, I was being slightly when you facetious. Say we check. <laughs> um, I think it's a fair question. I also think that there's probably some, something that we can do with the agenda just looking at this. Uh, at the very least, I'm wondering if it would make sense for us to move up the MSBA SOI process conversation, because we have some members in the community here who I'm sure <laughs> don't want to stick around until midnight to uh, have this conversation. I see some smiling faces in the audience. <laughs> that is your main suggestion. Yeah. So if, if the committee's okay with that, um, let's move up that discussion. Dr. Morris, is that okay with you? Absolutely. Okay. Okay, so next item on the agenda is the MSBA SOI process. <laughs> Dr. Morris. <laughs> so uh, I don't have a tremendous amount more to share from last, this is Thursday. Um, I think the two things that I wanted to share that we do have the staff session scheduled and the staff have been notified um, by email on Friday that uh, they're the they're three consecutive days, the last week in January, and we let all staff know about all three dates so that if someone had a conflict on one of them, they could attend, you know, if you, Monday was at Wildwood and you have a conflict on Monday, you can go to Crocker Farms on Tuesday. And um, so we let all staff know. So those are scheduled and, and formalized. The other thing to note is that um, the chair, I don't know if you want me to comment it or you, Mr. Donez, but the chair and I were invited to talk at the town council or to be present at the town council on Monday the 28th? Yes, although that seems like it's still kind of a gray area. I'm not quite sure. Yeah, I think yeah. my voice trailing at the end was trying to. Yeah, neither one that. of us are quite clear on that. I think uh, we are meeting with the, the town council president this week um, and town manager to uh, better understand what that request might be. Um, again, I think just to, to restate what we talked about last meeting, town council is very eager to support our efforts to reach out to the community and get feedback, which is great. So um, we are hoping to have this meeting and then maybe, you know, I don't know if we necessarily have to be at the town council, um, but at the very least come up with some sort of, of plan for engagement that then can be communicated back to the town council for decision making and, um, and carrying out. Does that sound fair? Those are my expectations anyway for the... <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I talked to, you know, the town manager just literally a couple hours ago whenever we started, and um, I think there's some hope of kind of a very condensed mm -hmm. version of what I presented last Thursday, um, just so that they're in the loop, because they certainly get a lot of communication from the public so that it gives them a bit more context than they might have. Mr. Nakajima, Mr. Dumling. Yeah, um, so I think we saw an email a while ago about a potential invitation for the town council on this subject. I guess the only thing I'd say, which I think sounds like you're planning anyway, is I'm hoping that the chair and the superintendent would both go, because I think when we're talking through the process, mm -hmm. um, I don't know how we do that without the school committee being obviously represented to the councilor on what our approach is, as well as what your thinking was. Makes sense. Yeah. Mr. Dumling? Um, yes, I was gonna say that, so plus one of Mr. Nakajima's comment. Um, uh, yeah, so it, it's been great to hear the town council's enthusiasm and wanting to be engaged. It's, it's also very appropriate because one of the technical requirements of this is that we want the town council not just to vote on the statement of interest, which they would need to do anyway, any statement of interest, but we want their understanding and we want their feedback and, we, and ultimately we wish for their full approval of the consensus statement, which is going to be a very important, powerful piece of that community consensus. So getting them involved uh, and, and answer and give, providing whatever information that they would want to hear, uh, I think is, is very important. So I think, yes, in the interest of time, giving them a, a condensed version, but I would certainly forward them the full presentation that you gave. Um, you know, if there's additional edits, um, enhancements to that, um, that you wanted to do, uh, that you thought was maybe more appropriate, you know, one, one because I think it, it is a long presentation, but I think it's as short as it can be while covering a pretty lengthy topic. Uh, there wasn't a ton in there about the, um, the notion of, uh, of the driver of fiscal responsibility to the town. It, it, was, it was a bullet on, on the MSBA history slide, but it sort of didn't get its own showcase. And um, I think rightfully so for the introduction, you know, we're talking about the educational urgency that is the wheelhouse of the superintendent and school committee. Um, but, uh, you know, that being said, even the, if there wasn't the educational urgency, the fiscal responsibility and the fiscal urgency of the town is a huge huge driver as well, so um, 
I don't know, just think whether that's a comment or another slide, you know, because I think, I think that the presentation that the superintendent gave is, is a pretty good document to be able to socialize to the broad public as, a, as an introduction to the topic. Um, so um, just, you know, to, to think about that. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Great. Sure. Mr. Nakajima. Yeah. Um, another question, too, is you, you mentioned that you had scheduled the staff discussions and presentations. And I don't know if um, the committee knows what those dates are, but I was, I was wondering whether you feel it's appropriate or welcome or you'd let uh, members of the school committee come and just sort of sit in and listen to what's going on, like not say anything, but just sit and observe what staff say. I, I'm very open to that. I think if, if we're gonna have a quorum, even if you, even if the intent is not to say anything, I think the safe approach would be to post. So what I can do is ask Ms. Westmoreland to just, I can send those dates out and if we have a quorum, just post it as a school committee meeting because you may get asked a question directly and it feel awkward for staff to ask a question of a committee member and not be able to respond. I just prevent Mr. that. I mean, this may be something that the committee itself wants to discuss or debate or something like that. But in an earlier meeting, um, I had expressed the opinion that given the importance of this topic and um, you know the, the mm -hmm. depth of feeling that everyone has expressed about the subject, that it would be ideal if a member of the school committee, I mean, I don't care if it's all five of us, but I'm just saying, at least somebody goes to every single listening session so that when we come back to debate what we're gonna do, um, in addition to taking the, you know, if we do a facilitator, whatever their report is and whatever summary you provide, that we can actually warrant that we've actually directly been hearing and listening to people and, and taking that information into account. I would totally agree with that. I think that, uh, and, and we did discuss this before, um, although I, I, you know, I think from, from that comment, uh, initially I had taken, it was really the community sessions, so perhaps, I don't know if Dr. Morris did the same thing, but, but I agree, I think having uh, committee members present for the listening sessions, you know, at least a, a large majority of them is, is critical uh, for showing that. So Dr. Morris, you can send along those dates, or Ms. Westmoreland will, thank you. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to mention was in your packets are, is the proposal from um, Bill Logue, from the Logue Group, uh, for managing the listening sessions and facilitating the discussions. Um, and it's, you know, it, it was a fairly quick proposal that he put together, uh, understanding our timeline and wanting to make sure that the committee had a chance to review, you know, what his, how his team would work and sort of, you know, his initial ideas. He is open to feedback um, and changes, of course. And I think, you know, upon reviewing this, uh, it actually feels like a, a pretty good plan, pretty comprehensive plan. Um, you know, it, it incorporates uh, reviewing background materials and, you know, planning the process for listening sessions using uh, both past experience, but also, you know, the, the, this community's experience. Um, and then facilitating six listening sessions, which is what we requested because the three sessions already that the Dr. Morris mentioned for educators and staff are already handled. So these would be six community uh, sessions, three for parents and caregivers in the district and three for community wide. Um, and then uh, involves working with various organizations uh, in the, a network, basically, of, of um, you know, folks who do this kind of facilitation around uh, tricky issues, really, in communities. Um, when I spoke to Mr. Logue, um, you know, he explained that this, uh, he's, he's had a lot of experience working on issues that have been divisive in communities. Um, and so likes to sort of have a, you know, a, a kind of working group type of feel around the sessions so that it's not just somebody presenting something and talking at people, but that really they feel like they are a part of the process and providing feedback um, into the process. And I think that that seems to fit this community, you know, pretty well, uh, just given the interest in this, on, on this topic. Um, and then I think possibly most important, I think, you know, the listening sessions, it's important to do them well and to have a neutral party facilitating. Uh, this is obviously somebody who's got a lot of experience with that, but it's also the post-session follow-up. So gathering the notes um, 
and the raw data from note takers, which this committee has, has expressed an interest in before. Um, you know, I think, uh, Ms. Spitzer, you may have been the person who mentioned this at our last meeting about making sure there's some sort of feedback, you know, form that was being utilized. So this is exactly what this proposal uh, talks about. Um, and then preparing a draft and a final summary of, you know, what was heard during those sessions that can then be presented back uh, both to the committee and the community. So um, this is in essence what we had talked about before. Um, you know, he's come at, uh, I think the, there's two costs that are shown on this budget. So one is the estimated cost and then one is the not to exceed amount, um, which is fairly standard for, you know, for, for proposals like this. Um, so he actually breaks down what the cost would be but it comes out to 11740 for estimated cost and then not to exceed $9,990. So I don't know if the committee has had a chance to take a look at this proposal. Any thoughts or, or questions? Mr. Demling. Uh, again, I'm always looking at the clock, so considering. <laughs> How many more times will I do this? <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm always looking at the clock and the, the schedule and the time is going to be against us throughout this whole process. And so, um, Given that we were nowhere with this before, this, this I think is, is, is excellent <laughs> um, as an approach. Um, uh, Mr. Logue is, is also the um, public forums consultant for the Regional School District Planning Board. Um, we, we found him, uh, so when we, just to, just to give you the origin story and the public the origin story, uh, the Mass Office of Public Collaboration is the state organization that ran the, the last um, uh, possible, was it, uh, uh, seventh and three to the middle to the high school study, or what was it sixth grade to the looking we'll at Dr. Morris? Seventh and eighth, seventh and eighth grade. grade. Yeah. Anyway, a um, uh, board member, Mary Lou Tylman, uh, had a very uh, reported a positive experience with that. We reached out to them; they were unavailable. But um, Mr. Log is an affiliated member with MOPC, so that was the the origin there. Um, I, I'm really thinking about logistics and like our next meeting, you know, and so. What, what is the to-do list of, that we need to check off before we leave tonight? <laughs> and so I'm thinking about <clears throat> voting the contract, scheduling the sessions, advertising the sessions. Um, we talked about this public email blast. Um, and I just, I'm, I'm, I don't want us to leave here tonight feeling like we've made good progress and then realizing, oh, we're not meeting until the end of February. So I'm sort of looking to Dr. Morris about the Well, schedule. I think just to, to respond to that immediately, I think, um, you know, we, we definitely want to vote this proposal. Um, I, the in terms of scheduling the listening sessions, that actually would would happen with the facilitator, um, because it's also con, you know dependent on his schedule and, and sort of what he can do, he and his team can do. Um, so I think we can probably we can come back at a later time with that information. Um, just as a reminder, too, the committee had uh, tasked Miss McDonald, Dr. Morris, and myself to actually come up with the format of the listening sessions and take care of that so the committee wouldn't have to and so we wouldn't hold things up. So if that still works for the committee and for Ms. McDonald and Dr. Morris, um, I, would, I would think that that's how we want to move forward because I agree, we don't want to leave this sort of, you know, hanging out there. We definitely have to get moving on this. Um, so that's, that's what I would say. Dr. Morris, I don't know if there's anything else you were, that's what you're going to say. <laughs> So I, I don't know if, um, you know, we had talked about this proposal coming at our last meeting. Uh, if, if folks feel ready to vote on this, um, if there's any other considerations or thoughts, Mr. Nakajima? Yeah, I just wanted, I guess I'd go back to uh, something Mr. Demling said a moment ago. Um, it's the, your experience, I don't know if we have any other review of prior work that would basically give a thumbs up in terms of experience with this firm? Uh, Mr. Dunling? Yeah, so um, so we, we were very deliberate about trying to select our public forums consultant. Um, we have a limited budget on the regional <laughs> school district planning board. Um, so he came and met with us. He's from North Connecticut, so it's a drive for him. And every member of our six-member board had glowing, glowing things to say about, about him and his response. Um, I'll also mention, you know, that um, he was uh, there with us at our last meeting in terms of planning forums, and uh, we've run into some potential snags with, that we'll get to, hopefully, at the end of the agenda um, with the regionalization. Um, uh, the call into question whether or not we want to do public forums right now, and we just signed the contract with him. 
And so he, he offered, he's like, he's like, look, I, I understand, you know, that you might be running into a situation here. He's like, if, if you just want to, you know, part as friends and, you know, and, and call it quits, that, that's fine. And this is after he had signed the contract. So I took that as a very goodwill gesture on the part of um, his, his willingness to work, that he's, he's not lo looking to make a, a, a quick buck and he really wants to understand. And um, I really liked his approach of wanting to call each of the individual board members to get their point of view in addition to being at our open meeting. Um, so there's a, a line here about we call with several school committee members, superintendent, and two or three other stakeholders. Um, I would think, so as Ms. McDonald, Ordonez, and um, Dr. Morris are, are planning this, that, you know, the two or three that come to mind would maybe be uh, mem a member of the town council, um, and maybe one or two members from the public who mm -hmm. have uh, um, advocated strongly on different sides might be a, a one way forward on that. But yeah, and generally thumbs up. <laughs> it's short answer your question. Dr. Morris, can you just remind the committee about what your standard process is for, um, you know, sort of reference checks? Because I think that that's sort of what Mr. Nakajima was getting to. <laughs> so, uh, we would I'm speaking. Is that a microphone? <laughs> um, uh, I'm unclear if that was completed already for the uh, project Mr. Demling spoke about, and whether you know. So I, I, it's just something I'm not I'm not aware of. So I think there's a couple different ways that we could probably do this, right? I think that the reference checks definitely need to, to happen, um, and I think that it's you know we can either vote uh, to move forward with this uh, proposal contingent on reference checks, right, which have to be done. Or, um, you know, we had talked about possibly trying to schedule another, another meeting uh, at some point very soon just because we have, you know, a couple of other issues that we're, we're attending to. So we could uh, do the reference checks and then hold a vote until we come back. Um, Mr. Nakajima? If there is a best practice that you or Mr. Mangano wish to share, I would welcome hearing it. Um, I probably should shut up now and just listen to that before I say anything else. Um, I think I will. <laughs> I'll start by Dr. offering Morris, a yeah. slight preference that since we don't have another meeting scheduled and we don't know what schedules would be like, uh, a vote, a contingent vote, a vote contingent on reference checks would be probably preferable than the alternative, you know, with a report on the reference checks one way or the other at the next meeting, but I think because of the timeline issues that we have, um, that would be my preference, but I'll turn to Mr. Mangano. Yes, uh, so we typically try to do two or three reference checks. I think we have one quasi because the Mass Office of Public Collaboration or Communication uh, recommended him as, a, as somebody they work with and we've had direct experience with them that was positive. Um, so I think we would reach out to at least one or two more to make sure that it's positive. Mr. Nakajima? Yeah, so I was going to say, um, now I'll jump in. Thank you. Uh, I, I mean, the reason I was asking a question about the experience of the, of the regional uh, regionalization board is that I am personally comfortable voting it now based upon the good word of Mr. Demling and his colleagues, knowing that you're also going to go through the due diligence of doing the reference checks, and if you find anything that we should know about, you won't go ahead and sign the contract. Like in other words, our sort of hurry up, we got to get going stuff will not unduly influence your due diligence. It will not. Uh, Ms. Spitzer and then Ms. McDonald. Um, I guess the only piece of feedback I'd give on this proposal, and I understand it's not the contract, is that we don't have um, a timeline in it, and I'm assuming that somebody communicated that timeline to him. Um, but given it is such a tight timeline, I'd want to make sure that um, it's reflected in whatever mm -hmm. final proposal or contract we end up executing and that we get the feedback 
as soon as he can possibly produce it for yeah. us. So a, a general sense of a timeline was uh, communicated um, because we didn't have the actual listening session scheduled or anything like that. You know, I think um, some of that's going to be contingent on that, but it is, you know, this is what we knew going in, that it was going to be difficult to try to pull this together with, you know, a, a good report and all of that. So um, I think it's, you know, it's a little bit of a risk, definitely. Ms. McDonald? I was just going to add that this is um, this proposal only addresses the the listening sessions, mm -hmm. the six listening sessions. So it doesn't mean that we're not doing any of the other outreach that we've been talking about Good at point. previous meetings. Good point. Mr. Dumling, did I see your hand up? Yeah, just that um, in terms of technically, um, so this was so we got a proposal of similar format uh, for our um, public forums, and and technically what happens is that you know Mr. Mangano would. Uh, Use, use the district template to write up the contract, and then re, it's really the scope of services, that, that one page at the end that, that sort of translates mm -hmm. uh, what's in the, in the proposal. So, so when we're voting, uh, we're voting to um, you know, ap approve a contract based on this proposal contingent on. Yeah, excellent point, yeah. So uh, just to, to reiterate, I mean, I, I'm also comfortable with, you know, um, given the fact that we know that there was uh, at least Mr. Dumling and, and the group that he's been working with had had an initial, uh, you know, sort of uh, recommendation about this this particular firm. Um, at the same time, I also think that you know, understanding Mr. Mangano and Dr. Morris's uh, typical uh, approach for this, that we would be looking for reference checks in order to make sure this is okay. But I'm also comfortable just voting on this proposal in, in order to move forward and then uh, coming back uh, to the committee with reference checks and you know, a final contract at a later date. Mr. Nakajima? Move that the Amherst School Committee uh, approve the development of a contract with the Logue Group uh, based upon uh, the proposal submitted to the committee January 17, 2019, contingent upon uh, successful review of references. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Signify by raising your hand. Okay, it's unanimous. Thank you. So uh, I assume Dr. Morris and Mr. Mangano uh, will sort of take it from here. Um, I can certainly send Mr. Logan an email just tonight to let him know that this was, uh, that we're, you know, uh, attempting to move forward, but that you'll be in touch with him for, for references and all of that. Great, thank you. Um, so assuming there's no other issues or comments on this particular item, uh, we will move on. So the next item on the agenda is the uh, fiscal year 20 capital budget information. Yep, so there's our presentation in your packets uh, from Mr. Mangano. Um, again, we'll, it's a little bit high level. Um, and you know the first part of our meeting tonight had a whole lot of food for thought as it relates to capital, and you'll see that there's in this presentation, there's a placeholder um, that we have because we have not done the prioritization as, as we referenced earlier yet. Um, but um, oh. as Mr. Mangano logs in. It's the presentation that says restoring our school's response to questions. While he's getting it in, just uh, just to give him, um, just to remind the committee of where we are, so perhaps this can go um, not super fast, but fast enough. Um, this was, there was questions about how the FY20 costs uh, were calculated and what book it was. And um, so what you see in the presentation is kind of very specific um, factors as to how the costs were calculated. Uh, there was also a question about what would happen in a revised plan if both schools, uh, or two of the three elementary schools were placed in five years. That one, we didn't go to the same level of detail of how those costs were calculated. It was much more, uh, what, we, what could we live without doing uh, if we knew new schools or highly renovated schools were coming in five years? Those were the two key questions that the committee members had that we wanted to come back with more information. So I'll get right into it. Um, so TAG certification, I won't spend a lot of time. It's 
I spoke with um, Alma Electric, who is out of Westfield, and they perform this type of certification. And so they basically verify that the information we shared last time is how it works. They'll come in, they'll do like an audit, they'll look at the major electrical systems. They'll identify issues that they see up front that we would need to rectify. Um, and if we fix those, then they would certify our equipment for some length of time. Um, and if anything breaks during that length of time, they would come in and fix it. Um, so it's probably something we should do anyway, at least the initial audit, whether we do the certification, depends on where that gets funded. Um, but the, sort of that review seems to make sense given the age of our buildings. And there's a link there if you want to find out more information from them. So the second question was how are the costs calculated? So um, I went into more detail on these specific projects. There was one more for FY20 that was sort of a specific project that we ended up pulling off based on the um, what could we live without if we had new schools. It was the new generator. Mm -hmm. um, that, the generator project was really sort of a community project of making the, I think it was the Wildwood site, like a shelter if there was something town-wide. So given the priorities of the other projects, we pulled that one off. So for each of the projects, there's sort of three major cost components, and these all come from an a industry resource called Building Construction Costs with RS Means Data. So it's a thick book that has lots of um, indexes and pricing information, and that's what populates each of these three um, components. So the first is des uh, design and engineering, so it's the architect, the engineering um, costs from bid specs to managing the project. Most of the projects have that. There's, I think, one project that doesn't really we don't, we don't require design and engineering, so that's not part of it. Um, construction of costs, so what is the, uh, the, the raw cost for the labor, the equipment, the cleanup, equip, um, demolition. And then the last piece, which can be larger than the actual cost, depending on what we're looking at, is the markup. Um, and so this is based on a variety of factors that are outlined up there. Um, this is probably the most liquid because it sort of depends on the contractor at the time who's bidding on the job. You know, do they need work? Do they not need work? Um, you know, what time of the year are we bid in it? I think that plays a role. So this is sort of conservative using the estimates from the, the book. Um, but obviously, we've seen pricing come in lower uh, at times. So the first one, uh, Fort, River Wild, Fort River and Wildwood exterior doors, we actually reduced this from the uh, last time we presented it to you. We have more up-to-date information on exterior door bids because we did one this summer. Um, so we brought the cost per door down to be closer to what we received actual bids um, over the summer. So I think originally the cost per door was 5000 or something like that. We ended up bringing it down to 3000 per door. Um, so you can see the, design, the construction cost. This, again, doesn't have much design work because we can manage it in-house. Um, and yeah, we replaced 38 single doors. You can see the markup versus the construction piece, but um, that's how we got to the, the total cost. 1.2 million for HVAC for all the schools. So this is comprised of two pieces. One is replacing the chiller systems at each school, and the other is putting in new control systems at each school. So both of those would, re would require some level of design and engineering, um, and the construction piece, and then the markup. Um, so it's really sort of one per building, but they're big ticket items. $150,000 for Univents. Again, this probably would require design and engineering. I say that because our new facility uh, supervisor has a lot of HVAC experience, so who knows? He might be able to manage that without um, that support, but this is how we arrived at that cost. It would replace 13 unit events, and I think on the plan there's money to do more unit events going forward. This would be a start. Uh, last one. Um, so replace drinking water outlets, so not much design and engineering, it's just give sort of how many outlets do we need to replace. This would replace the outlets that weren't replaced after we did the last round of testing where we took out a bunch immediately. Um, so this would pretty much replace the rest of the drinking water outlets. And this includes the fixture, but also repairs to the walls, if we have to go into the walls to take things out. Um, some, some outlets now require different uh, heights and things like that, so it includes everything. I think this goes back to the conversation we had starting at six o'clock tonight that um, that frankly wasn't in our um, approach a couple of years ago. We were fixing the current outlets, not being cognizant of 
uh, their height, we just were just fixing the outlets, which given the context made sense in some ways at the time. Uh, since we're not in that kind of situation, we have to think through all those things, including what we've learned with the ADA audits um, as well. Um, so I just, when we talk about the wall, I just want to put a finer point on that piece. And then this last piece is the replacing the shingled roof at Crocker Farm. So we've done some repair work to it, but this would be replacing the shingled section with a, a metal roof, um, a roof that would extend, that would last for 30 to 50 years. Um, it's more expensive, but you get much more out of it and you don't have to worry about the leaks. So the last question was, what would we have pulled off the version presented to you um, a couple meetings ago uh, if we were to have new schools you know, in the next five years or so? So this is sort of an updated uh, picture of that, but I'll just go to the end because it summarizes what was taken off. So we pulled off the generator, as I mentioned, for 75,000. Uh, we pulled off both roof projects, Wildwood and Fort River, um, but we did leave money for repairs in the meantime. Um, we took off the electrical service upgrades, again, but we have the, the, the tag certification still there to kind of monitor the situation. And we pulled off the window replacement at Wildwood and the Fort River parking lot. So the total of the projects that were removed, if again, if we were gonna have a new you know, replacement for those two schools was about 7.2 million. Um, we did add 50,000 at each school for ADA upgrades as a placeholder for now for next year based on the report. Um, that would be, could change uh, based on, you know, how you guys get into that. Um, but it'd be a start uh, at prioritizing those um, projects. And then we also, as I mentioned, reduced the estimate for the exterior doors by 46,000. Mr. Demling. Um, so thank you for putting this together. Mm -hmm. um, Uh, I'm just going to soldier on. Oh. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for putting this together. Um, so I, I understand that in capital planning, you, you need to be conservative to an extent because you're putting in a placeholder for, mm -hmm. for funds that are, are promised to you by the town and right. you need to plan for. Um, and we, we talked a little bit about, um, I think it was either the last meeting or the meeting before, about how for some of these large items, particularly the roofs, um, it, it could be 2.5, it, maybe it's less. Mm -hmm. um, and I think... Um, I think it's important for this total, so it's you know, 7.2 million removed from the five-year plan if both schools are replaced in five years. That's, that's an important number to, um, so in terms of this theme of um, wanting to be as clear as possible with, with the most reasonably defensible data about what, and fiscal re, being fiscally responsible to the town, we, we don't wanna um, underestimate the impact, but we don't wanna overestimate it either. Um, so it's hard when it's, so is it, is it possible to restate that as a range we say, so, you know, we would save certainly between X and Y, as opposed to, you know, it's, it would, it's going to be 7.2. Yeah. Um, so, again, I think the, the numbers that are budgeted are budgeted very conservatively to make sure that the projects come with, in within the appropriation, um, because you don't want to not be able to do a project because you way underbid it, um, which has happened before in the past. So I think there, there is a level of conservative conservativeness. Um, so if I was going to give a range, I would say between six and seven million, because I think the projects ultimately would come in lower than, some of the projects would ultimately come in lower. Um, in particular, the roof projects is a good example. We, we have updated estimates on the roof that are lower than the three million, but we also don't know, you know, are we going to try something different um, with solar, or, you know, is, is there going to be some other piece to it that could bring it up to the three million? Um, so again, I think it would be, if anything, it would come in less than, than what those figures show. So I would say between six and seven million. Mr. Demley? And, and just, would, it, would, it, would it materially change if it was within six years, just because six years is the phrase we've been using at, sure. you know, versus five? I don't think so, no. I, that's why I said five-ish. Um, you know, I think if they're within five years, if we know there's gonna be new schools at some point after, after that, I think it, we would be, keep the same plan. And all this is given the facility director is starting tomorrow, the new facility director is starting tomorrow, and he's gonna look at this and dive into it and have his own thoughts. Um, so I think, you know, this has been vetted by the prior facility director, um, but I think the new, we need to give time for the new person also to look at it. Yeah, yeah so that, that's what I was gonna ask, is, is that it, you know, in terms of achieving maximum robustness with mm -hmm. the estimate, um, uh, that we've, you know, uh, turned every stone uh, over, you know, so that we can confidently say, you know, this is the, the cost savings, I think that would be very important. So sure. you're already doing that, so thank you. Okay. Dr. Morris. Just very briefly, we've already had conversations, I've already had conversations, as is Mr. Morgana, that this is a high priority. And I think, you know, things like the roofs, I agree with everything 
Mr. Mangano said, and you know, one of the things he experiences at UMass is when you have a condensed time frame to do projects, sometimes the cost goes up. So you can get a cost estimate. You're saying, well, actually, you only have between June 25th and August 16th mm -hmm. to complete this project, which as compared to his experience at UMass, where the summer, you can shut down a building for essentially an extra month uh, as compared to a K-12 district, sometimes has an impact on costs. So I, I, I'm not gonna speak for him and his thoughts, but he talked about uh, when he has projects in this area that have short time frames, you can do them, but sometimes to get the people power to do the projects increases the cost if you have a shorter time frame. So I think those kind of dynamics are why a range is really appropriate because it's, you know, a cost estimate and then putting it into reality when you go to bid and you say, well, actually, you know, you got nine weeks to do it, that can have an influence on the end up the total cost. Mr. Nakajima. So thanks. Uh, we asked a bunch of questions last time, and I think you did a great job of coming back with some, uh, some detailed and good answers um, that can help guide us and guide you. Um, and you, you put in a placeholder of something a little less than 50,000, I think, for um, addressing some of the yeah. concerns. Um, I think you started talking about this at the beginning, but I'm assuming in a future meeting you, you might come back with more details on how yeah. to organize the thing we learned earlier into something useful. The, the cool thing, if you want to call it this, was that there were enough inexpensive items on those lists and um, all three elementary buildings that you could imagine yeah. being, if we could, as Mr. Delmick said earlier today, if we could figure out what would actually have the most impact and differentiate between the low cost items, it seems like you could make a real difference in, in the learning and teaching environment with that amount of money. I would hope. Yeah. Any other questions or comments from the committee? So I would just say um, thank you for, yes, for responding to all of our questions uh, from last time, which there were quite a few. Um, I think one thing to make clear is this second to last slide, and I'm not sure we ever gave you a chance to finish your presentation. <laughs> okay. We talked about it. Okay. Just sort of dove right into the questions. Um, is that this is actually, so you know, the, the capital budget was actually for the next five years. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know, I appreciate seeing the slide saying that this is a revised plan if both schools are replaced in five years. Um, but, you know, obviously we, we don't know if that's actually going to happen and so this is, um, you know, it's helpful information just to see the, the way that you're thinking and weighing, you know, the, these different uh, projects. Um, you know, I would say that it, just in, in thinking about the designer engineering piece of this, uh, it sounds like the ADA presentation or audit that we just had will factor in a lot to, to these costs, right? And so this is something that, um, you know, I think we are gonna have to maintain some flexibility on, right? Because we don't know uh, kind of what's coming back yeah. and how they were in interact with some of these, like the exterior doors, for example, you know, those are, um, you know, from what I understand, a lot of these exterior doors actually sort of have a sort of set width and there's, you know, framing that's gonna happen. But if, if there's actual uh, changes or adjustments that need to be made in order to consider accessibility issues, that may end up impacting some of these costs as well, right? right. So, um, you know, I expect that some of this could change or, or should change mm -hmm. um, as, we, as we dive in. Um, and I guess, so my question to you really is, is mostly about uh, kind of next steps. I think we, you know, we have um, information that is, is very well researched and has been pretty clear. I, I would definitely love to hear from our new facilities director mm -hmm. uh, at some point in the near future, his assessment on, on these figures um, and you know, get some further input or explanation before we go in front of the town to, to request you know, any of these funds. Uh, again, we don't know what's going to happen with the MSBA application, so, um, you know, it, it feels to me like it, it's prudent for us to move forward as if we are not getting that at least this year, um, mm -hmm. just so that we are prepared and the town is prepared, quite frankly, to set aside funds if necessary, because these are such high ticket items, right? This is not, yeah. you know, uh, just casual money. We're talking about some serious money. It's necessary money. I mean, it's, you know, obviously I think that there's uh, the conditions that have been 
uh, shared with these buildings is, you know, are, are serious conditions, and we want to address them as, as soon as we can. Um, but I definitely think that, you know, we want to be able to, to bring all this information to, to the town as soon as we can. Dr. Morris? Yeah, so just briefly, I mean, that's on his top of his list of, it's a lengthy list, but of uh, things to do. And uh, Mr. Mangano, Ms. Cunningham, and I put together for, for him. He's meeting starting with Ms. Cunningham tomorrow morning, first thing. Um, I think none of the items in this year's capital budget would be affected by anything related to the MSBA. These are, to your point, they're relating to current conditions that um, new building, not new building, or renovated building five years from now, they need to be addressed immediately. So uh, I've communicated pretty clearly with the town manager and pretty regularly around the needs of these uh, for these items, and then certainly we can have um, Rupert come back with more clarity on the questions that you asked, um, because I think Mr. Magana will, you know, gladly pass the torch to, to him to be uh, doing these kind of presentations and, and this work, because this is, this is really his work. Yeah. So just a follow-up question, is there a timeline then that we're thinking about in terms of uh, you know, having that information come back to the committee, further revisions if necessary, and then just moving forward? So I don't know when the first JCPC meeting is, because um, I think we'll have to balance that with the timeline of when uh, Rupert comes back. Um, I do agree with your point about we may want to leave those projects in until we know, um, especially since they're not in the next coming year. Um, they won't, it's better to leave them in so you can quantify the trade-off. Um, if we get new schools, here's the, what we save. Um, so I think having that guidance is helpful. Um, and then, you know, once I find out the first JCPC meeting, I'll share it with you all. Great, okay. Okay, um, so, I don't think there's any further questions or comments from the committee, and we'll move on. Thank you, Mr. Mangano. So the next item is the initial budget presentation. Just as a reminder, this is, this is really uh, closest to the 30,000-foot view of the budget. Uh, when we come back in late February, that'll be the much more specific um, budget to look through uh, with more specificity on line um, ads reductions. Um, that sort of thing. There is one particular item around preschool that I would like to spend um, perhaps a brief minute on tonight uh, to come back with more detail at the next meeting. But I think other than that, I'll just have Mr. Mangano kind of lay the kind of general foundation because um, I know the hour is late um, about how this year is looking and then comment on one item because there was an attachment in your packet um, related to preschool and that item. And um, we'll come back with more time and, and much more detailed discussion in February. I was just asking if we could have these even in your office or yeah, someplace yeah, we'll in a central that. location. Um, I've, this is a conversation that Mr. Mangano and I have had in the past about my un inability, apparently, to uh, be able to follow spreadsheets in electronic format. And so having paper <laughs> is really helpful. It's just something about the way that I, I don't know, I just look at information like this. Um, so you all have iPads now. Jerry was um, nice enough to get, put those together today. I kind of gave him a late call to get those together, and he did it. Um, so those have the full budget document on them, um, which is the same thing as what's in the binder. And I'm not gonna go through all that, but if you have any questions, it's set up the same way as it has been in prior years, which is sort of introductory information, information about the organization, then the finances and the line-by-line -line details. So if you wanna see specific lines, like the libraries or um, computers, you can kind of see that detail. Um, and then it's followed up with some more information. Um, but the PowerPoint's sort of a snapshot of that info. So budget highlights, uh, the budget that's being proposed right now is $23,838,854, um, which is uh, consistent with the guidance we've received from the Finance Committee. And it includes 295,620 of additions, 286,927 of adjustments. Adjustments are things that are not programmatic reductions or additions, but based on enrollment changes and things like that. Um, and $40,000 of reductions. Um, the proposed budget still maintains high-quality dedicated staff, community and school programs, um, average class sizes that promote learning, high-quality and district-specialized programs, um, and a wide array of specials. Um, and it invests, and you'll see in the ads and cuts section, in some specific things like dual language programming, uh, curriculum materials, Dr. Morris will speak more about preschool, um, and special education. Uh, this is just sort of a 
new summary chart that may be helpful, may not be, uh, but it helps. It's one of the reasons why our budget, um, the increase that we receive from finance committee is higher than usual. Um, usually we're below the 2.5% guidance this year. We're actually slightly above the 2.5% guidance, and that's because in FY18 we had this really precipitous drop in our out-of-district students. Um, so this chart actually shows the net students leaving the district, so it um, compares charter out and choice out versus choice in students. So um, you can see back in FY11, FY12, we had 80 net students leaving the district. Um, we instituted the school choice program somewhere around FY13, FY14, um, and that combined with our charter numbers and our choice numbers sort of flattening out, We've actually reduced the net number of students leaving to, it was below 10 in FY18, it went back up a little bit in FY19, um, but it's still in a really good place compared to prior years. Um, so again, the, the flattening out of our charter and choice is what helped contribute to our budget guidance being higher. Some other budget highlights, so um, some of the enrollment-based reductions, we've seen a reduction or projecting a reduction of two classrooms, that's just based on rolling sixth grade out um, and projecting a new kindergarten coming up. So we have a couple four, four classroom sixth grades that are going out and they're being replaced with two or three classroom kindergartens. Um, and then we also have a significant shift of special, special education students going to the region. Um, so with those special education students come paraeducators that are one-to-ones um, or program uh, paraeducators that work with those students. And so there's a reduction there, but you'll see when we present the region budget, you'll see a corresponding increase at the region level. Um, so good news sort of for the elementary level, but um, it's not going anywhere. Uh, and then health insurance reduction, which you'll hear more about in the Q2 report, but our health insurance has taken a favorable twist after a very negative twist. Um, so our enrollment patterns have changed quite a bit. You can see on the right that little chart that shows our FY19 budget for uh, enrollment plans and then what we're projecting for FY20. And so the big shift, it's a, it's a reduction overall, but the big shift is actually we have way fewer PPO plans now than we have HMOs, um, which translates to real dollars. Um, and the surcharge going away for the second half of the year, we're not projecting it to return next year. Um, and that was actually about 11% of the premium if you compare it to that. Um, and, and with this reduction, we're assuming a 6% increase in premium rates. We expect that to be lower. Um, we're going to get information on that very soon. Um, so the next time we present this budget, we'll probably have an actual number for health insurance. And then lastly, the sort of the largest piece. Sorry, Mr. Mangata, Mr. Nakajima. Yeah, um, so you showed on the front slide uh, an overall reduction of $40,000. If we come in at 4% on insurance, do we make that back or? Uh, $40,000 reduction? Yeah. Um, possibly. When we get into more detail on the reductions, that's something that we may do anyway. Uh, it's, um, it's not really programmatic at this point. It's something we don't currently have, but still in the budget. Um, so I think it'll be a, a question that we'll have to discuss. But in terms of the dollars themselves, I think yes. Mr. Demley? So am I interpreting, interpreting that first slide correctly? So mm -hmm. 40,000 reductions. Like how do I interpret that bullet item of numbers to this, like, in terms of, how would you phrase that in terms of level services budget? So it nets out to like a $30,000 reduction to level services. Um, you'll see it when we get to the ads and cuts page. It'll, those numbers are broken down specifically on that page. Um, and you'll understand it more at the next budget when we present the details of each of those numbers. Mr. Dunley? I will just say a preemptive yay, given that we cut over yeah, half overall. a million last year. So did, that, is, to me, is like a fairly positive take home. Right. <laughs> Listen to you speak, so yep. thank you. Yep, and we, again, we hope it that it'll improve um, between now and next time. We expect it to improve between now and next time. Um, so last one is uh, for budget highlights, wage increases, which is usually the largest part of uh, budget increases. So we have one and a half percent cost of living increases for all union staff, except I should say UFCW, somehow V got in there. Um, UFCW is a 1%, and the only reason for the difference there is that those contracts were negotiated in different years. Um, we brought UFCW in in an off-cycle year, so there were sort of different economic conditions um, at the time when we negotiated those contracts. Um, and then along with c COLAs, there's contractual steps that range between 2 and 6%, um, depending on what unit you're part of. Budget calendar, so um, we did the strategic program reviews mostly tonight, uh, the budget presentation tonight. The detailed additions and reductions will be shared with you um, about a week before the 26th, and then we'll come and speak with you about, about those on the 26th. Um, and we'll also post those on our website so the public will have access to them as well. 
Um, and then the vote would be March 19th, unless something changes between now and then. Um, a little wrinkle in the timeline, now that um, the government, the form of government has changed, is the school committee must submit proposed budgets uh, to the town manager by April 1st. Um, the town manager must submit a proposed budget, which includes the schools, to the town council by May 1st. The finance committee of the town council then reviews that proposed budget and has to make a recommend, will hold a public hearing and then make a recommendation to the full town council by May 30th and then town council must take action by June 30th. Hmm. Um, so the budget's moved back in terms of when we know it's actually approved. I don't know how, quite how that'll affect um, like JCPC votes and things like that in terms of capital funding, um, but at least on the operating side, it's pushing the vote back to June, which sometimes town meeting was in June anyway, but, uh, <laughs> or closed in June, but. Um, how does that affect uh, your planning? I mean, this is, you know, summertime almost. <laughs> I mean, the capital piece in particular is going to be, you know, if that vote is in June, that pushes back sort of our planning, because in past years, capital be, um, was typically approved early on in town meeting. It was one of the first things that they looked at. Um, even though it's not official till, till town meeting closes, we could do a lot of um, preparations ahead of time. Um, the other thing sometimes we can do is do bids or procurements sort of subject to approval of funding at town meeting. Um, it's a little different with town council not knowing what yet when they're going to vote. We may still be able to do that. I think Dr. Morris. the other thing, which we're not enacting this year, but if, if we, a future discussion, certainly not for tonight, would be given the later timeline, do we push back this process a bit? Do we have a little more flexibility to not start, uh, as Mr. Mangano said, with so many variables? You know, the house, the governor's budget's not out. The health insurance isn't known yet. So um, it's just something for future consideration that I, I would have loved for the first budget you see to have fewer variables than the first budget you typically see. So I know that's a, like a big topic, but you know, I could imagine some positive to that. Mm -hmm. Mr. Nakajima. So this is an unfair question that I'm going to ask and you might not answer and I'm okay if you don't. Um, so a budget has to be like, like the state budget, um, you know, has to be, approved before July, by June 30th, because the fiscal year starts July 1st. Mm -hmm. That doesn't prevent the legislature from passing a budget earlier. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just curious whether there's any tea leaves as to whether the town council is oriented and organized right now more towards June 30th or more towards like June 1st. I'm saying that because also the previous thing, finance committee must make recommendations. I mean, everything here is you got to do it no later than this date, but there's nothing preventing any of those, including, hey, look, if we vote for it on March 19th, we're already 12 days ahead of our schedule, right? Um, I'm just, I mean, I know that's an unfair question because yeah. you don't know what the town council is doing, you don't control it, but I'm just totally curious whether you know whether they're pushing toward the last possible date or some earlier date. Yeah, my expectation is because of the newness of it all for you know, most of those steps is that it's probably gonna be closer to the end of that range, yeah. um, but we'll see. Um, and, and we'll probably find out more information in the coming months uh, as to what they expect. They, they'll probably have a timeline or calendar out. Uh, so it's just some information on our budget process. We're gonna have uh, meetings with schools, um, get feedback, talks about the budget guidance process, the process we went through with principals and directors, so it's um, sort of what we do every year to build the budget in the first place. Uh, so a quick summary of the actual expense budget. So total salaries are going up 598,433 under level services. Um, only so much of that is actually from Steps and Colas, actually a, a big chunk of that is explained on the next slide. Um, substitutes is going up 29,630. Expense accounts are staying pretty flat. Um, mostly due to the health insurance reduction is offsetting some other increases. Um, and then the net additions and reductions, which includes that adjustment number from the first slide, is 31307 to get us down to the, the budget that meets finance committee guidance. So on the expense budget, um, I won't go over the, the collective bargaining piece again, but a couple other factors that are contributing to that payroll increase. Um, so right now we're decreasing school choice funding by 70000 in terms of how much is being used to support the general fund. Um, last year, because it was a bad budget year, we increased it quite a bit and we went a little bit above what we were going to bring in. So we've brought it back down to sort of a reasonable estimate. Now, this number could change. Um, you could say use more, use less, um, and you'll get more information on school choice. 
Um, it's really your decision in terms of how much school choice funding is used to support the general fund. Um, but right now, it's using about 550,000 from school choice to uh, offset the general fund. Um, so the other two pieces um, are grants. So we have two grants that are shifting down, one sort of permanently, one is more of a shift between Amherst and region. So the first one is the preschool grant. That, it continues to go away. So we've got one more year of that. Um, it went from about 40,000 this year. It's gonna go down to 30,000 next year. And then it's gonna go away. So we're gonna have a sort of a $30,000 drop off for FY21. Um, and then the other piece is the IDA grant. That grant covers the region, Amherst, and Pelham. And historically, Amherst is sort of, the elementary level has been a little overrepresented on that grant. And so we're trying to, because this is actually a good budget year for both districts, um, we're trying to realign that in a way that's more consistent with the enrollment. Um, so that also decreases the funding to Amherst from the IDA grant. And then the last piece there is the $20,000 decrease in circuit breaker funding. So our special education expenses are one of the few areas that are going up for next year. Um, and circuit breaker, we applied to tuition out of district first. And so there's more of that down in the expense accounts, um, which leaves less to cover payroll. So in the past, when we would use it all there, and then the balance would go to payroll. Right now, there's not a balance to go to payroll anymore. Um, in substitutes, we're increasing due to, um, we've had higher experience lately than what was budgeted, but we also are increasing due to the minimum wage rates that are going up um, every year until they hit $15. Um, so we're factoring in that we're gonna probably have to increase our rates just to stay competitive. We're not required to meet minimum wage as a municipality, but we think a, it's the right thing to do, and we have a hard time finding substitutes, um, and we'll have an even harder time if we don't keep pace with minimum wage going up. Um, and then in ex expense accounts, so the health insurance reduction, um, utilities are locked in, so that's a good thing. All of our uh, rates that we locked in for next year are either roughly the same as this year, or they've gone down. Um, oil we locked in went down, electricity went down a little bit, um, gas might have gone up slightly. Uh, food services is stable. That's another area of the budget that we think we might be able to find a little bit more savings. We, ca we kept it flat, I think, from the prior year. But all indications so far is that the program's still doing well, um, consistent with last year's progress. And then special education, that's the one area of the, one of the big areas of the spe um, expense budget that went up. Um, it's gone from about 120,000 due to um, two more out of district students than we had this year. Um, so that area of the budget's rising. So this is the sheet that'll be much more detailed when we share it with you next time. Um, right now it's sort of in groups. Um, and I'm gonna pass over to Dr. Morris. I just wanted to highlight, so the, the budget adjustment section at the top, that's the 286.927. The budget additions is the 295.620 in the middle, and then the bottom piece at the bottom, uh, budget reductions, 40,000. So those are the three elements that add up to the 31307, which will likely change between now and next time. Dr. Morris. Actually, I, I wonder if it would be more clean if Mr. Mangano finished the presentation, um, and then I'd speak so about the preschool. preschool thing, which is if you follow the flow of the packet, it, sure. you know, okay. is that okay, yeah. Mr. Mungo? Um, so there's a few trend charts I put in just as examples. So in your line by line, there's trend charts like this for all of um, the departments, but I put a few in here that are sort of interesting. So this one shows regular education classroom spending. Um, the dip you're seeing is fewer classrooms as enrollment's gone down, um, but also we've had a lot of staff turnover and retirements in the last few years. Um, we've seen sort of a bubble of retirements, um, so that's reduced costs. Um, and then the increase is just, we're sort of projecting a flat level of staff going forward with steps and colas. Uh, ELL, as you heard earlier tonight, we've seen an increase in spending there. Um, our numbers are going up, and so there's been investments there um, as we see larger numbers. Uh, preschool spending has been pretty stable. Um, it's pretty linear in terms of its investment. And insurance and benefits, you can see we we're pretty around the four million mark until FY17. The second half of FY18, we had that really large mid-year uh, bump up, so that's why that jumped up so much. Um, and then you can see the correction that we're projecting for FY20, it's gonna come back down a little bit um, based on the experience we're seeing. This slide, I won't spend too much time, it's little summaries from your um, full budget document, that, but this summarizes the funds we get from grants and revolving funds, which are funding sources outside of the general fund budget. Um, we get a number of grants and we have quite a few revolving funds as well that help support the operations of the district. Um, again, it's not explicitly part of the general fund that you vote, but it's operations that are important to the district. You've seen this chart before, still good news um, overall, so I won't spend time here. 
Uh, so school choice planning, um, I think Mr. Demling asked during budget guidance that we do school choice, and we said let's do it during the budget process because it's more connected. Um, so slots are made available at each school based on class sizes um, and how many seats we can fill at each grade and still stay within the class size guidance. Um, it is based on a lottery system. It's $5,000 per student, plus we get a special ed increment for students that have special education needs, so it can be uh, more than $5,000. Um, and the sending district pays that cost to us. And likewise, when we have students that go out, we pay that to them. Um, and the funds that we receive for choice in students um, are tracked in a revolving fund, and that fund can be used to cover costs normally paid by the general fund. So this year, um, we had about 90 choice in students, I believe, and so this is the locations that they come from. You know, outside of Belchertown, which you can see a big chunk, um, there's quite a spread of where they come from. Um, we have 10 from Holyoke, nine from Hadley, um, you know, 15 from South Hadley, five from Springfield, so it's a pretty, you know, uh, wide range of communities that send students here. Um, and this chart, lastly, just kind of summarizes uh, a snapshot of the revolving fund that manages the choice uh, money that comes in. So the purpley blue bar is the choice expense, so that's how much we're pulling out of the choice revolving fund each year to support the general fund. Uh, the revenue line, which is peach, um, is how much money goes in. So however, however many students choice in, that's how much money that relates to those students that goes into this revolving fund. So you generally want to see the peach line, or the peach bar, greater than the, the blue purpley one, or about the same. Um, again, we, this is, we have a relatively new school choice in program. We started, I think, in FY13, so for a while there we were building up mm -hmm. the fund balance um, to get to a place where we had a, a stable amount. Um, in FY18, you can see uh, we had a really good year. That year we increased our slots quite a bit in terms of school choice. We were able to accept more students. In FY19, because we had the tough insurance here, the um, expense rose above the revenues for the first time. Um, and then for FY20, we're proposing what we think is going to be about even in terms of expenses and revenues, but we'll update our estimates as we go forward. Um, and then the green line is the fund balance in the choice revolving fund. So it's peaked at about $790,000-ish, uh, went down a little bit last year, um, or projected to go down a little bit, sorry, this year, FY19, um, and we, we hope to see it stabilize going forward. That's what we think is a good balance to maintain. Mr. Nakajima, did you have a question? Yeah, I did. So <clears throat> the purpley bar yes. look, in, F, in FY20 mm -hmm. looks like it's a little higher than the peachy bar, mm -hmm. to use your language. Right. Um, is that a mistake, or is it actually a little higher? I think it's a little higher. Um, I think we went to 550, sort of a round number in terms of what we were going to pull out to support, um, and the revenue is based more, it's based on 5,000 per kid, but there's also sort of a per student special ed increment estimate, so I think it's a little bit higher than what we're projecting to bring in. Um, FY20 choice slots are a little fluid right now because of the dual language program. We're still trying to wrap our heads around how many slots will be available because that will shift things a little bit in terms of the enrollment in the district. Um, so we're being sort of conservative on the choice in slots right now. Um, I think as that goes forward, you know, there may be more choice in slots than we're projecting here, so the revenue might be a little bit greater. Mr. Nakajima? Um, okay, so I was just wondering if maybe for the next presentation we could find out how much more revenue we think we're gonna use mm -hmm. than we're taking in. Sure. On choice, I thought the old the old saw was, you should always try to be below, in what you're using, especially you know for your operating budget because you don't want to get caught in a get situation. A gap. Well, but also you don't want to be caught in a situation which is sort of a structural imbalance because right. you, you know you like have to have the choice slots and you may not want you know what I mean that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I can give you the exact amount. It should be pretty close. I mean, it should be looks like a ten. Ten or fifteen thousand dollar difference at the most, but we can get you the exact number. Mr. Mangano, the five thousand um, dollars per student. Uh, how is that set? So it's set by statute, um, and I don't think it's ever changed um, since it was created. So it's always been five thousand. It's always been five thousand yeah. since twenty. I think nineteen ninety something. I believe Morris? it's part of Ed Reform in nineteen ninety three. Yeah. Okay, and is that true for the special education, uh, like additional cost as well, so or is the, that, do so they the, use a different formula for that? So there's a different formula for that that I think it has been adjusted. Um, I'll have to verify. I think it has something to do with the circuit breaker 
rates that are used to calculate special education needs, but I'll have to verify to make sure that's correct. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Dumling? Yeah, it's just, I know it's late, but it, it's worth pointing out since you brought it up. It, it's one of the grossest, most inexplicable inequities when it comes to school choice and because uh, charter tuition, right? It's, you know how that's calculated. You have, our, our charter out cost is about, it's about 20, if not more. It's about four times as much. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 we're, and the school choice is a flat fee that hasn't been updated since, since, since 93. You know, and that's, that, that's what they said uh, when it came to um, ed reform, it was the fair amount to pay. So it's just, it's, I'll stop there. Any other questions or comments from the committee for Mr. Mangano? I think partly it's the hour. <laughs> and the lack of detail. And also the thoroughness of yeah, this sure. presentation. <laughs> Mr. Dumling. Yeah, so just general. Um, so one sort of question for you and one for Dr. Morris, I guess. Um, for you in general, um, you know, I, I look at like the circuit breaker, charter reimbursement. There's so many different buckets to advocate for at the state level of things that are underfunded that should be. You know, there's a huge push for Chapter 70, you know, which would help us out somewhat. Um, but I'm always trying to balance in my head from the Amherst School District perspective, which of those things hurts us the most? You know, I know it's a different conversation at region, you know, because we don't have regional transportation reimbursement at this committee. So that's sort of, sort of like the, what are the areas of advocacy focus that are going to give us the most bang for our buck? Um, and, and my question for Dr. Morris um, is, um, and I wouldn't expect to see it on this presentation, but I've always wondered, and you know, maybe now's the time to start talking about it, about having some kind of a line item for promotion or marketing of the district um, it's just, you know, the, the more we get into um, uh, advertising what we have and, you know, charter schools and all that um, and seeing what an oversized return on investment is, uh, you know, given that it's on the order of 20000 per year for one student, um, just, you know, any thoughts on that and, get, and getting that above zero and what the future might hold for that line item. So on your first question, um, I think for the elementary level, it's a little different than for the regional level. Um, circuit breaker and I think charter reimbursement are probably the two that have the most direct impact on us, just the way the town's budget works in terms of everything going into one pot. Um, those two go directly to the schools, so um, those would have a large impact if they fully funded the formula. Dr. Morris. If I could add to that, um, so many of you may have seen that there's a discussion at the State House now on you know, lots of different recommendations on funding and there's there's four different scenarios laid out and Two have essentially no impact on this district, and two would have pretty significant impact on this district. So I think just um, it's not exactly what you asked, but I do think um, right now there's a whole bunch of elected officials debating, you know, which of these methodologies would work better. So that, that's a little more broad than individual items because there's actually people doing, they've done the math, and, and the math is pretty clear that half of the recommendation. I'm not making a, a general statement on fairness more generally, but if you're talking about this particular district, two of the four models around fair funding have no impact on this district and, and two do. So, you know, if anyone has more questions, I can share. I think I've shared spreadsheets, but if not, I can share more spreadsheets of what's out there. To your second question on marketing and promotion, um, I think that'll be a better question to answer in February when we come back and can talk in a little more detail on the specific ads and cuts. And I just want to say um, it does my heart good to hear Mr. Dumling talking about communications and marketing. <laughs> You've come a long way. <laughs> um, I just wanted to raise, a, thank you, uh, you know, Mr. Mangano, for, for putting this together as usual. Um, I think that we have a lot of good information here. Um, you know, I, I think that also just looking at the timeline for submitting the proposed budgets to the town manager, um, and then seeing what the <coughs> steps are that follow from that, um, that I, you know, I am still, I think with the new form of government that we have, that it's always in the back of my mind that one of the abilities of the town council is actually to reduce the school budget, whereas town meeting did not have that ability uh, previously. They could reject the budget, but they couldn't re reduce it, if I, if I am remembering that correctly. Um, but it's not to say that I expect that that would happen uh, with with our new elected leaders. But it does give me, uh, you know, sort of reason to to think that we could play a much larger role in presenting the school budget and uh, the rationale for it. 
especially given the fact that we have uh, newly elected leaders who may not have had as much experience with the schools previously or the budgeting process. We have some folks who were not on town meeting previously. Um, and we do, and we have some folks who did, who were, um, but that there's just varying experience and awareness of what the budgeting process looks like for our schools. And even if I'm not necessarily concerned about it for this particular budget cycle, um, I just think that it's good practice moving forward for us to think about how we, I know that Dr. Morris has a very good relationship with our town manager, which is wonderful. Um, and I expect that we're gonna have a very good relationship with the town council as well. But just to, you know, if we can cement that, um, moving forward by creating a process that allows us to present the school budget, that that would help a lot, that would help tremendously. Mm -hmm. Mr. Nakajima. So I think you were just saying this last part. It's worth talking about next time how that's going to happen. In other words, let's think about that. I don't, we shouldn't think about that March 19th. Right. We should be thinking about that in, in February. Any other questions or comments? Okay, Dr. Just Morris. So um, in the packet is a letter of support um, for a joint planning effort between the district and Community Action Pioneer Valley, which is essentially, you know, more commonly referred to as Head Start. So over the last two months, I've had multiple conversations with the leadership of that organization. They provide, without getting through the whole letter, uh, they provide incredible amount of ongoing support for families for high quality early childhood access all over actually the valley in general, but there are two sites in Amherst. Um, and this really came to a head, I know it's late, but I think the 30 second narrative is worth it that uh, when we were, in, we asked to come to talk about the dual language program in the fall at the, the Head Start next to Wildwood, uh, not only were we invited in, they invited us to their open house because they really were so invested in the schools building, continued to build that relationship with their organization. And, and what we saw, it wasn't just me, it was multiple staff members, was just incredible amount of relationships between their staff and their students and we got a better sense of their programming. And so it dawned on me, given that we we're struggling with how to provide high quality preschool seats um, to all the families who need it in our community, that this might be an organization to partner with. Um, so what we've loosely talked about, and there's going to be a proposal, and it's loosely, it, it is in the documents, it'll be much more flushed out a month from now, is almost like a planning grant. Uh, we usually think of grants coming from external sources, but this would sort of function that way from, from an internal source. For our early childhood education team, uh, their, their team, um, and perhaps they, they know of a consultant who has worked with multiple communities around building partnerships between not just the schools, but actually towns, schools, and Head Start programs to increase opportunities for young children. Um, there's an incredible amount of logistics and uh, bureaucracy about how they get funded. They can't accept funds from some organizations, they can from others. Uh, and we really need a group to sit down together and see what's possible. So uh, again, I'll talk more at an earlier hour uh, in February about this, but the thing I'd like to propose exploring is uh, sort of partnership grant where we can work with, with community action, uh, the town and the schools to see what is possible. Um, do they have capacity to add their um, their existing programming. What would funding? What for funding sources can they accept? What funding sources can they not accept? What's the role for a district partnership with such an agency? So, uh, I, I know some of the feedback very bluntly that I received after last week is, "What about preschool?" Um, and so this wasn't a response to it because, as you know, this was organized. I don't know when this letter is, but uh, we've been talking over the last couple of months about this, uh, and it's not part of a building any SOI projects or for MSPA. So I didn't reference it at that meeting, but it is something I know collectively we all care tremendously about and can partner with the community agency to see what's possible uh, with the existing program that already provides transportation for all its families, has full day programs, um, seems like it has high potential. Um, so that's what that ad is, is stipending our staff and then um, working through um, people who have done this in other communities to show what's possible in Amherst. And, you know, it's not as fast as we'd like, right? Like many things in this, uh, this line of work, but I do think it's the right next step for us and the community uh, to partner and, and really for the town uh, to be involved in this as well because this is it's a school issue because kids go to school, but it's a town issue because if residents can't find affordable early childhood care for their students, there's ripple effects that go way beyond what we do in, in K-12. So that's my condensed version given the hour. 
Thank you, Dr. Morris. I actually uh, was excited reading this um, and thought that uh, you know, exploring this possibility farther is is just a, a great way to to think about how we might be able to bring expanded preschool to our community and to our families. Um, understanding the restrictions that we have, just in terms of facilities and budgets, um, and also understanding the need for it. Right? We've we've talked about that even when the budget cuts last year. Um, how much it pained, you know, many members here on the committee, but, you know, yourself as well and our staff uh, and our community definitely to think that we would be losing um, any, any part of our preschool programming uh, in the district. So I, I think this is great. Um, it's creative thinking. It's, you know, um, exploring other options. And yes, the timeline is not ideal, but at the same time, you know, provides some, some hope for, for moving forward. Mr. Demling? Yeah, I, I appreciate the creative thinking. Um, I, I look forward to seeing the detailed proposal, how that works out. I, I really like the um, including including the town as much as possible um, as as a as a primary partner. Um, and by town, I mean town in like the broadest sense. You know, it's when we want, we've obviously heard about preschool through the the ups and downs of the building projects, um, but it's it's uh, been quite um, interesting. Um, I think uh, to see it broadcast so consistently from so many parts of town in so many different conversations. You know, it's not just a school committee thing, it's not just a building project thing, but this, this near universal town value, you know? And so when we think about what are creative ways to structure or, grant, or have grants or um, partnerships between different organizations, you know, there's a whole network of potential government and social organizations that we might not be uh, aware of or have experience with, but other people who work in town or who volunteer or might have knowledge of. So I, th I think that is the right way to approach it to, you know, to take some leadership on it, um, but, you know, to bring the town in as a, as a primary resource as well. And, you know, have, have, uh, get people's input on it. You know, there's a lot of, lot of community interest in, in this. Yeah. So um, I want to pause here for a second. Uh, we've been meeting for five hours, <laughs> and I see energy levels just tanking at this point for everyone in the room. Um, so I'm wondering if uh, maybe we can take a couple moments to think about this agenda. Just, and I know Mr. Dumbling had raised this previously. Um, you know, there was a lot that we've been kind of pushing off and trying to fit into one meeting, but it's just really not, uh, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think that maybe, um, is there anything on here that absolutely has to be decided on tonight you know, I'm looking at gifts, like maybe we could do that, you know, fairly easy and quickly, right, and get that off the, the agenda. But in terms of fee discussion, uh, the second quarter budget report, the Fort River Feasibility Study. Okay. I see nodding heads. <laughs> yeah. Um, and in terms of the uh, Fort River Feasibility Study Building Committee report and uh, the regionalization update, those are fairly quick, except I know that there was a, the regionalization one we, we sort of. I can make it as pretty condensed as possible and then let people ask questions and make I can make it as short as possible, and then if people want to ask questions, I can elaborate. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And I apologize, but I think I, I do need to leave just because it's five hours and I'm a nursing mom. Um, yes. So I could potentially join remotely if there's anything, but I, I also trust you guys to handle this. I don't think okay. that's, yeah. So I really apologize. No, I, that's. I don't want this to. Indeed. You should not be apologizing at all. <laughs> yes. So good night, and um, I will look forward to the next meeting and any updates um, from members of the committee. We, and we can catch up okay. after. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you so much. Okay, so um, fee discussion, second quarter budget report. Uh, the committee will get back to Mr. Mangano with any feedback or comments. Um, and Fort River Feasibility Study Building Committee update. We had a meeting and we looked, uh, there were some revisions of the site plan in terms of fields uh, based on the feedback from the prior meeting and reduced the number of fields and we talked about you know how large they had to be there were what I would term minor cost adjustments associated, and that's the update. Thank you. Any questions or comments for Dr. Morris? 
Okay. Mr. Demling, uh, do you want to update the committee on the regionalization discussion? You've sort of hinted at it a little earlier today, and there's... <laughs> All right, so I'm going to set my watch for two minutes. We'll see if I can get my summary under two minutes. Nice. Um, so Regional School District Planning Board has been meeting every two weeks diligently. Um, on the 28th, we had a fairly substantive update from our financial consultant. And uh, he was primarily tasked with modeling what's the financial impact of both districts if we regionalize. Um, and there's a lot of detail, but to summarize, uh, one of the, um, the, the simple component to, um, to share about uh, financial impact is potential increased reimbursement for a building project. So uh, there's a formula about uh, the percentage of a building project that gets reimbursed. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, one of the factors in the formula is that if you're forming a new regional school district, you get an extra 6%. So um, our board is not tasked with estimating a building project cost, but you know you, you can do, you, do your own math. If it's 50 million, that's $3 million extra reimbursement. If it's 100 million, that's $6 million extra. So that's one factor to consider. Um, the other that's more complicated is the assessment method. And I'm not going to go into whole detail on the assessment method, but basically it's a formula for determining what the operational budget split is between uh, shared towns. And so um, what was presented to us was four variations on assess two uh, statutory and two uh, alternative, uh, essentially using your most uh, commonly used variables, five-year average enrollment and a variation on transportation. And the upshot of that was is that, um, so in, in these four variations, uh, Pelham would save, compared to not regionalizing, okay, would save between 1.1 and 1.3 million. Uh, Amherst would lose between 619 and 738,000. So to put that another way, uh, it would be more expensive by 600, 619 to 738,000 Am to Amherst to regionalize. Um, as you might imagine, this update has given us pause to reflect and actively discuss the implications. Um, and so uh, uh, at our last meeting, we um, provided, uh, sent back some input to our financial consultant and asked him, uh, are there different ways to um, use different variables in the formula to calculate an, an assessment that would result in a savings for both districts? Because that's really is one of the, the hopes, one of the primary drivers of potentially regionalizing. Uh, and so, uh, they are going back and, and doing that modeling. We have a meeting this Friday morning um, down the hall <laughs> or downstairs uh, to discuss that. Um, and, um, you know, but I, I just want to frame it appropriately that, it, you know, these are more complicated than your standard issue uh, formulas. One is called assessment by agreement, which is a uh, kind of a brute force way to say, here, we just agree to pay this. And then in future years, you create some formula to add on to that, but you just sort of like, agree to that amount. Another one is using two or three different variables um, that um, might uh, come at a number that we're looking for. Um, and so uh, I won't opine on, on these because we're still actively discussing this in open meeting, but I, I will just share the observations that we've had in our meetings, which is, um, you know, we want these to be fair and sustainable for the future. And we're very cognizant that to recommend regionalization is a decades-long, multi-generational mm -hmm. agreement. Uh, that has to survive a lot of different economic environments and people. Uh, and so um, everybody might be happy with it today, but is this something that is, can be agreeable in the future? And we know what disagreements over assessment methods can look like. Uh, it also has to be explainable and justifiable to the community. You know, when we're pitching regionalization, you know, how did you arrive at that number? What was your logic? What were the actual reasons? And not just were you trying to get to a number? Um, this also might have an impact on our public forums planning. So Bill Logue happened to be at our meeting when we were discussing this, um, where he said, yeah, you, you, if you want a clear answer about the financial benefits and you determine after you exhaust that maybe that's not the case, that, that, that may affect how you want to proceed with public forums planning. So um, it's, it's kind of another, you know, to wrap up, kind of another um, example of this general problem that Amherst is much larger than Pelham. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in terms of five-year average enrollment, Amherst is 16 times the size of Pelham. And um, it, it's like we saw in our previous discussion about school committee composition, what's logical and fair. Um, the mass general law that governs regionalization is not set up to be optimized for one very large town and one very sm small town. So that's the, you know, the structural challenge that we're, that we're running into. And so, yeah, we're discussing it on Friday. Thank you, Mr. Demling. Dr. Morris, uh, two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything you would want to add to that, or is that a? Um, the only thing to add 
to flip back to the agenda with Mr. Demling's comments reminded me is this that the feasibility study is looking at um, public engagement dates and I'll make sure those get sent to you when they're finalized. Oh, great. Thank you. But that's it. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the committee? Mr. Nakajima? Uh, Jessica, I mean, I wish you luck. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, it, it, the challenge of it is, is that um, given the asymmetry of the sizes of the towns, you have, we have, you have revenue inputs and you have expense inputs. And the problem is if you really want to, if, if, other than looking for different formulas, if you really want to do it, then what you have to do is you have to put all the variables on the table and see how do you rationalize them in a way that reduce expenses. And that leads you, so you have like one third rail over here, which is does Amherst want to spend another $700,000 on budget? And then there's another third rail over here, which says what if you radically reorganize the services um, being expensed in Pelham to reduce the overall budget in a way that saves money for both parties? That is not a recommendation on my part, or even advice to you. I'm just saying that's the problem with this whole thing is that, mm -hmm. is if you, I mean, I'm not saying you are, but if you start with like deal breakers over here, then what you do is just set up non-starters over here. And it's just, it's a really challenging process. So I wish you luck, but also I think at some point, whenever it's appropriate, we earlier in the evening, it's worth like, our committee engaging with you more on, on, on what you're learning. I think very much so. I would agree with that. Mr. Dumbling, is there something you wanted to add or? Yeah, just that, um, so we talked briefly, well, we're gonna finalize it this Friday as to whether we wanna meet every week because we sort of seem to be at this point where we really need to resolve mm -hmm. this kind of issue. Um, and there was one other thing I was gonna share. I'm sorry, I'm spacing on it at this, at this hour. <laughs> it's late, yeah. Oh, oh I, I, okay, so that, this was the point, is that, um, you know, you say you wish me luck, so I appreciate that. Um, I, I have to say, the, you know, the committee's been extraordinarily uh, faithful to the principle of objectivity, but yes, we will get to a point where we're now, all the information's in, we're debating the merits of whether do we want to recommend going forward with regionalization or not, but to this point, we've been very um, neutral on do we want, you know, we're not, we're not out to recommend regionalization or not. We're trying to gather all the information and then make the clear determination, so um, you know, kudos to the members of the board that have stuck it in this long and, you know, I, I, think, I think there'll be some satisfaction in knowing that we, you know, we, at least however things uh, unfold, that we've, you know, clearly done the due diligence of, of uh, exhausting the, the analysis. Well, thank you, Mr. Demling, for, to you and the committee for uh, your diligence in, in pursuing all of this. Really appreciate that. Okay, uh, so moving us along, we're going to accept gifts. Um, if, can I have a motion? Mr. Nakajima. I move that the Amherst School Committee accept the following gifts. Uh, Marla Solomon um, for the Armstrong 104 flute serial number 6146208, estimated cost 275. Anonymous $500 for the Crocker Farm Library and $200 per 18 teachers for classrooms at the amount of $4,100. Uh, the committee to elect Stan Rosenberg, uh, check number 10921. Donation for fifth, fifth and sixth grade Chorus Transportation High School on December 2nd, the amount of $131.80. Eddie Ramos Castaneda, uh, check number 1060, Family Donation Center donation, the amount of $20. Legal and Voters, uh, check number 1191, to purchase books on government, civic engagement, and politics at Fort River, $500, Wildwood, $250, and Crocker Farm, $250, for a total of $1,000. The grand total of these gifts is $5,251.80. Thank you, Mr. Nakajima. Can I get a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, all those in favor? Great. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we have uh, school committee planning. Just very quickly, I think there's a few different items that I had documented. Um, so, uh, and then there's a couple of items also that from just previous meetings. So, the formats of school committee meetings, I think, was an item that we had uh, talked about in one of our previous meetings in December, I think, or maybe early January. Um, there's dual language enrollment and then the ADA adjustments and the, and the budget. Yeah. Is there? So a budget hearing, school choice hearing, food service presentation, uh, which we didn't do tonight at this time, uh, sabbatical, we did a sabbatical for mm -hmm. the consider. And yep, that's probably all the other you know, standard ones that we can put back to statement of interest, regionalization, 
I know that um, we had talked last week about the possibility of maybe trying to get an additional meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what the committee's feelings are at 11.25 p.m. on Tuesday about having yet another meeting. <laughs> the same thing with Dr. Morris and Ms. Westmoreland and everyone else who has to support these. <laughs> Mr. Nakajima? Uh, I think we should. Uh, I think, but, you know, uh, if, if we agreed to do it or something, I think it, I would beg to have Mrs. Borland put out a doodle poll and not actually sit here with our electronic devices Completely agree. right now. Yep. yep. Great. Uh, Mr. Dumbling? Uh Update on sixth, sixth grade to the middle school facility study would be good. Great. Um, and uh, does not have to be next meeting, given the insanity of our planning, but sometime before the end of the school year, um, vaping prevention. I know we talked about this at the region, uh, but um, something that, uh, like technology, um, uh, addiction and management and such is something I'd like to at least start to explore the uh, conversation with at the elementary level. I'm just going to make a process suggestion given the number of topics that are starting to blend between Amherst and region and the, I mean, just very bluntly, the limited availability of evenings that I'm not scheduled from now until February vacation, uh, which is a small number and I'm not trying to everyone's working hard it's not like but it's just if 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 we can maybe coordinate some of those topics uh, being that every Amherst member happens to sit on the region um, as joint topics then it might open up the conversation in a way that doesn't have us redoing conversations or meetings just as a concept not that I have it all drawn out um, it may yield good discussions and a little more efficiency Perhaps the, the chair of the region and myself and Dr. Morris can talk about that uh, offline. We can make a recommendation for, yeah, for an agenda. Okay, uh, can I have a motion? Move to adjourn. Second. <laughs> All those in favor, I adjourn. Thank you very much. Thank you.